Hey guys, uh, this is Kyle Meadows, the uh, Education Coordinator for Cox Health. Uh, we are doing a virtual conference to give you guys some free CEUs. This is available and broadcast across uh, Southwest Missouri for anybody in EMS, uh, EMTs, paramedics, first responders, uh, advanced EMTs. Um, we do have a couple of things in order to issue CEUs and we'll cover that here in just a second. Um, first, like any YouTube thing, we want you guys to like the video, hit that, I think it's over here, hit that like button right there, thanks guys. And go ahead and subscribe to our channel. That helps us boost this so that maybe we can uh, broadcast this further as we move along and forward with this. First, I want to ask that you give us, uh, give us a little space. If we have any technical difficulties, this is the first time we've ever done that or done this. So I appreciate it. If we need to, we'll just throw up a screen for you and get it solved, but we'll come right back. We will let you know when this is over. All right, so how this will work and we'll explain this every time, is there is a chat feature. If you do not have that chat feature available, you are likely on a phone, on the mobile web browser version. Just go to the three dots in the top right, and then click desktop, and it should bring up your YouTube app. If you don't have a YouTube app to use, you will probably not have the chat feature available, just so you know that. If you have any questions whatsoever, we do have uh, a paramedic and educator with us, Jessica Estes, who will be answering questions, responding to you, and will help feed questions to myself and Dr. Brandt while we're, while we're up here. So feel free to ask questions as we go along. Don't wait till the end. I will warn you, we have anywhere from a 10 second to a one minute delay, and that's all dependent on your connection. So if we don't an answer it right away, don't worry, we will get to it. Uh, let's see. If you have any technical difficulties getting on or you lose feed or anything like that, uh, we're going to put a number into the chat and you can text Aubrey, another educator with us, Aubrey Johnson. Um, and I'll just say it out right now. It's 573-823-3556. So if you have any issues, just feel free to text him. He'll help get you on the feed so that you can see what we're doing. Um, all right. So for this class, uh, first thing I'm going to do is introduce our medical director. Uh, Dr. Brandt. Um, then we'll come back and we'll start a class on critical, or I'm sorry, clinical critical thinking. Um, with that, we will have a test at the end, and we do have attendance checks that we're going to need you guys to get through. Uh, and that allows us to uh, confirm with the state that you attended this, and this won't count as online education, but actual live education. And so the state's been really good about uh, allowing us to do that. How that's going to work is you do have a link in the chat pinned to the top. Uh, if you click that link, you gotta fill out two things. You gotta in enter a code that will be given to you every time we do an attendance check. And I will do my best to say that when we, when we put one of those in there. And then you have to enter your Missouri license number. So if you don't have that available right now, be sure to go get that, find out whatever it is. It's the B dash number or the P dash number, whatever that is, enter that, okay? Um, and we want to get that within five minutes, and that tells us that you're attending. We're going to do those randomly throughout the broadcast. Um, and then there will be a test. Uh, we'll send out a link at the end of the day. It's 10 questions. It's not terribly difficult. So uh, be sure to complete that as well. If you hit all your attendance checks and you complete the test, then we can issue CEUs for you, and we'll get those out as soon as we can and be in communication with everybody. Um, also, we will send out at the end a feedback questionnaire. Obviously, this is our first time, and we really want to know how we can improve this as we move into the future. Uh, so there's a questionnaire asking how we did, what you thought, and any comments that you can provide. The NA comments don't really help us, so if you're going to fill it out, please fill it out and give us some real advice. We will use it. I promise you on that. So uh, I, did I cover everything, guys? Okay. All right, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our medical director, Dr. Matthew Brandt, uh, the Southwest Regional Medical Director, and the medical director for multiple agencies, and obviously Cox Health EMS Paramedicine. So uh, Dr. Brandt's going to come on and kind of discuss what the goal of these virtual broadcasts are for us. So Dr. Brandt. Trying to come up with some fast way to come in. Hi, uh, I'm Matthew Brandt. Hi. News flash. 
in February of 2020, a virus entered the United States and changed the way we're going to do business from now until it's over. Uh, I've really come to the conclusion that uh, there will be no day after, just a tomorrow. It has fundamentally changed the way that we're going to do education. Uh, the days of having grand rounds with uh, 50 to 100 people in it probably won't come back for uh, quite some time. That said, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think that our ability to reach out to a larger audience has been improved. Uh, this effort, which again, not only is a, an initial fledgling effort to, uh, to reach out, uh, is a, a new step, the next step in uh, our effort to form a contiguous public safety environment. Uh, and I'm really excited about it. I think that it's a, you know, it really achieves our overall goal of, of bringing us all together as one team with different uniforms. And I, I think that that's a great thing. Uh, this is the first chapter. This one, the one that you're watching right now, is the very first chapter in this new format, this new effort. Uh, this effort is free continuing education uh, units for all levels of public safety. So if you're an EMR, an EMT, or a paramedic, you can get your CEUs, hopefully all that's necessary for a yearly, uh, uh, yearly um, um, renewal, uh, through something like this. Now, I think again, with all of our other educational offerings, it's gonna be necessary to move into that. But this, this one particular, it's live, it's not online. Uh, this is a unique thing. And the technical capacity of the team that has assembled here is really, really unmatched. I'm extremely proud and very excited about it. So, so this is the first uh, period of instruction. It's going to be, at this point, monthly. We'll be inviting guest physicians to provide instruction. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's what it's going to look like. And uh, this is just going to be one, one component of this team's desire to meet that need. This is part of their vision to meet that, uh, that requirement to reach that overall objective. Uh, so, uh, I think that uh, this is a, a good thing. Uh, it's not necessarily the end of anything, but the beginning of a, a, new, a new effort. Uh, the way we're going to do business. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Kyle. I'll be around. So you can always ask uh, both of us or any of us questions. There's a large group of people in this very small room, thus the mass. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And I'm glad you're here. We'll talk in a little bit. Kyle? All right. Thank you, Dr. Brandt. Sorry when we can. Uh, next is population health, uh, the coordination of care, um, and reduce per capita costs. We want to reach out into the community and do what we can, just like this, working with the fire departments, law enforcement, all of public safety, uh, schools, everyone, uh, to work together to, to build better population health within our communities, the communities we serve, which we'll see in our mission statement here in just a minute. Um, academic medicine is another strategic priority for us. We want to grow, train, and retrain our top talent. We are big on developing our personnel, making sure that we help them achieve their career goals because that, that helps us all achieve the rest of these priorities. Um, and we want to regionalize and create access for our patients and our communities. Um, if you're not aware, we've recently acquired Barton County Hospital. In the, past, in the recent past, we acquired uh, uh, Cox South Branson, um, and those that those uh, objectives allow us to create more of a community of health with with that m meets the one patient experience and provides you know good quality care to the greater region here. So, next slide, please. All right, the mission at Cox Health is to improve the health of the communities we serve through quality health care, education, and research. 
And number two there is education, and that's why we're here. We're here for you to provide education. This is free. Uh, this is for the license levels of healthcare. This is to, uh, uh, to, these are full CEUs. We will issue certificates for you. So hopefully this helps you maintain your licenses as well. Um, and our vision, which I think is, is top notch because it's something that you can always look for, but you can't actually achieve. It's always in front of you is to be the best for those who need us. And so um, I hope everybody out there who doesn't work for us uh, recognizes that in the actions that we that you see with our people and for our people live up to this every day everything you do sh should be about being the best for those who need us and we're going to talk about that more in this class so um, and then our values you know safety compassion respect and integrity um, and I just ask all all of our people and everybody else to live up to those values with every patient experience ever in inter every interaction with other professionals um, and with each other so uh, let's live up to all those. Next slide. All right, so just to be clear, uh, none of the images used in this PowerPoint are ours. Uh, they are, there are a few. I tried to avoid any copyright stuff, but they are sourced from the internet. They belong to their respective owners, and that is not ours. We are not taking credit for it. But we are covering clinical, uh, critical thinking. Um, and this is a systematic approach to emergency field medicine. We are using this, uh, this uh, style of decision making in how we teach our recruits. And we want this to be more of an idea of not change overnight and start doing things the way we say, but, but start uh, thinking about how you can approach the problems you face with patients and, and uh, medical experiences in just a different way. Maybe look at it from a different perspective. And as you grow and start to expand that thought process, you will make better healthcare decisions. And so uh, that's what we're seeking from this. Uh, real quick, I just want to ask, am I in the little box on the side? Or is this full screen? Oh. This is full screen. Excellent. So, um, all right. So let's go to the next slide. And we'll just get started here. Click again. All right, so I included a few quotes in here because I think they speak to the pieces that we're talking about within the, uh, the PowerPoint and the lesson overall. Uh, so asking you to make a different decision, asking you to think differently about how you approach patient care, uh, it, it means that you have to be a little bit above average. Uh, so this is a quote, I don't know who said it, uh, best I could find is anonymous, but why settle for average when amazing is attainable? Uh, we can be the leaders in healthcare. Uh, we can we can drive the narrative for how things are done, following evidence-based medicine. So, uh, I challenge you to not be average. Next slide. All right. First, we wanted to find what is critical thinking. We toss this word around all the time as medical professionals, um, and you know, from the Cambridge Dictionary, it's defined as the process of thinking carefully about a subject or idea without allowing feelings or opinions to affect you. Uh, for me, it's, it's thinking outside the box. It's looking at a problem and not just seeing the problem, but seeing everything else that it could be. Um, and then trying to approach that with a process of elimination, which we'll talk about, so that we can provide the best care for our patients. So let's get started. All right, so starting out, uh, how do you want to operate? Are you an operator or are you a reactor in the field? We've all been both. We will all constantly move back and forth between both. Um, something that was really interesting, uh, I cannot remember who told me, but at one point I, I remember speaking with, with somebody who told me that, that the definition of anxiety is when your skills, the skills you possess, do not outweigh the challenges you face in life. So. I'm a very objective person, analytical person. So putting that into a math problem, as you see here, when the skills that you possess are less than the challenges you face, we typically find ourselves in a point of anxiety, um, confusion, and then our fight or flight kicks in and we tend to react to the situation. You know, And we've all been there, I know we have. Um, the idea is to limit how much we do this with patience and to do that, we can, we can flip the equation. Uh, through education and through, uh, through, through application of what you learn, 
uh, we can build our skill sets so that our skills are greater than the challenges we face on the, on the whole, on the macro. Um, as we know, the situations we face in public safety are, uh, are dynamic, they're variable. Um, you never know when something surprising will, will appear on scene or and we've all been surprised by how patients react or uh, the situations we find ourselves in. But for the most part, if we develop our skills appropriately, we'll be able to build that equation out the other direction to where our skills outweigh the challenges we face. And the, the neat thing about that is when you find yourself in that situation, we tend to apply structure and process to the, over, to the decision making. And we actually make decisions instead of reacting to what's around us. And the best example I can tell you about uh, moving through that that we, most of us can all relate to is you know, when I first started uh, driving, you know, my first attempt at driving, of course, you got the highway patrolman sitting next to you, judging you, uh, not nerve wracking at all, right? My skills were not as big as the challenge, I can tell you that much. So, uh, barely passed that, but I got a little better over time. But now, much like all of you, you probably forget when you're driving because you've, you've built that skill greater than that challenge, right? Now we even do other things like text and, and talk and whatnot while we're driving. Don't do that, by the way. But, uh, but that's kind of what I'm getting at. It's just, it doesn't have to, have to happen overnight, but we, we can build our skills to outweigh the challenges that we face. And especially in patient care, uh, by taking a little bit each day and learning from it, so. All right, everything you've been taught about decisions and decision-making in healthcare can be improved. Uh, emergency medical technicians, uh, first responders, they've all been historically taught to find the problem, to just simply identify what is wrong with their patient. Um, I, and I bet you can think back and somebody asks you, what is wrong with your patient, right? And then you go searching through your head, trying to find the answer that's gonna make them happy or in, even in the field in the moment, trying to find the answer that solves the problem, right? Stand by, there we go. Uh, medicine is not perfectly precise like this. It is a practice and it is a, it is a process, right? So we need to figure out how to do the clicky thing on this side. Uh, so the problem with that is only identifying, only picking one item, only you know, and even being led to finding one item by people asking, what's wrong with your patient? That is, that is leading you to identify the one thing, right? That's not quite how medicine works. Uh, it, it's more uh, eliminating what we know it's not and then, and then dealing with what we have left. So if you try and look for one item, that's what we call tunnel vision, right? And, and oftentimes, uh, we'll find ourselves picking one thing, and it's maybe not the correct thing, or maybe not entirely correct. Uh, and maybe we'll miss an assessment piece, or we'll miss a treatment piece, um, and, and we get zoned in on one type of thinking on a patient. Uh, so for your job from this day forward, and I apologize, I'm a really analytical person, so you're going to love me for all the ordered lists that we have in this PowerPoint. So they're all going to be numbered. And it's meant that, it, it's put that way on purpose. I want it to be, uh, uh, you know, number one is the most important, number two is the second most important in that list, and number three is the third most important. So that is the order of importance in, in every one of these lists throughout this presentation. But number one, your job from this day forward is to answer the following questions. What are all of the possibilities of what could be wrong with my patient? not just what is wrong with my patient, right? And number two, what in question one has the highest risk of death or injury? And keyword here, based on time. Everything we do is based on time, right? We have lights and sirens, we have system status management, we try to get on scene, we have shoot times. That's all for the benefit of the patient. And it's because the things that hurt, injure, or kill people faster are the things we have to mitigate first, right? If we have uh, uh, an open laceration squirting blood, we don't want to worry about the, uh, you know, the, the band-aid on the finger, right? Or we don't want to be doing a spinal mobilization while they're losing blood somewhere. So it's a, it's a method of priorities, right? Um, and then number three, although we know the risk of certain things, we have a limit to how much we know of how realistic it could be, a probability, if you will. 
So number three, what in question one has the highest probability of actuality with our patient too? So, so we, we identify what all could be wrong with our patient, what is the highest risk given the patient situation, and then what we know as we gain information, what has the highest probability of actually being an issue, right? So um, can you put me to the whiteboard real quick? So one thing that I want to cover real quick that I did not build out a slide for is just, just, a, just a, a rethinking of, of, of methodology, of methodology, cool. uh, uh, of methodology of how we how approach our patients. Our patients. So, so, I want you, I want to, you imagine to imagine like the, like the, uh, like the, like loading, the loading bar, bar on one on of, one your, of computers. your computers. And it's just, and it's a, just a, a, a progress, progress of, of time, time right? right? And we're going to call, call this, and I hope and I'm hope writing, writing this big, big enough. I'll, I'll use I'll bigger, bigger literature. literature. Patient, Patient care, care, and hopefully, and hopefully I, can I can spell, spell on camera. camera. Continuum. Okay. And so if this, if we were to mark this point in time as the beginning of an event, so somebody gets hurt, a medical emergency occurs, something along those lines. So this is our event, right? And over here, off to the right, this is the end of the event. And what is the end of the event? This is discharge. This is going home. Or, uh, or even off to like rehab to another facility, to long-term care, um, or possibly even death. Sometimes that's just part of it. But the end of the event, our discharge, that, uh, that's the end of it, okay? Where we exist in the first responder realm, in the EMS realm, is right here. We only occupy this space. Right, and even just a little bit after the event, because we have a response time, right? So, so we only occupy this space right here. We spend a lot of energy trying to shorten this space, and, and this is where we start to build our assessments. This is arrival for all of us. And hopefully you guys can see that well, but it's just a little chunk at the beginning, right? And then we typically, this is the key, this point right here is where we end our care, right? end of our care. The issue that I have seen, and I have personally been guilty of this, is at the end of our care is where we, we judge how well we did. You know, we dropped them off better than we found it. How many times have you all heard that, right? Um, but that, honestly, that makes me kind of scared. What we really need to start beginning to think of, especially even in the first responder realm, on the truck, law enforcement, how do the decisions we make in this small box, how do those affect this discharge, right? It's not so much about how we drop somebody off. It is, it is not how you transfer them to the EMS providers. It's not how the EMS providers drop them off at the hospital. It is how the decisions that you make here affect them when they go home. What is the quality of life for somebody that leaves the hospital? Because when it's your loved one, that's all that matters to you, right? To eliminate harm in the hospital, to mitigate the problem, and to get them back in your life as quickly as possible in, a, in as much of a normal way as it was prior to the event, right? And, and this sounds probably a little cliche and kind of obvious, but I do want to make it clear, like, this is the key. You have to think about every decision you make second to second while you're treating patients and your thought process, not as how you're going to fix them now, but how that, uh, how that affects the end result, the end outcome. And that, that right there is how we're going to improve healthcare in our community. So we can go back. Back on slide. Awesome. Okay. So I just wanted to get that out. I had not put that because it's just something I kind of do a little bit different every time. I like to draw that one up. So. Uh, but that's that's how I tend to to look at things. So um, it's not what you know; it's what you're going to do about it, right? There's a lot of academic stuff, but how do we make that actionable? What are the decisions? What are the choices? What are the things we do that actually benefit our patients, right? So emergency medicine is a fight against time, as we said, right? Stomp, stomp. Time is what we we're, we're fighting, right? Um, and we know that you know that's part of everything that we do. 
We even have specific classes of things that are tracked known as time critical diagnoses. In Missouri, the, the big ones are stroke, uh, cardiac arrest, and cardiovascular STEMI centers, right? Um, and some, some places do sepsis. Uh, we don't have anything official with the state right now, but that's still a, a time critical event. Cardiac arrest, uh, OB emergencies, these are all time critical events. Um, this is a technical field, it's hands-on. We have to make decisions as we go. And I know you've all heard from your classes and stuff, there's the real world technician, um, and there's a real world way of doing things, and there's the, this is the way I'm gonna teach you way of doing things. And I've always kind of disliked that personally because it creates the separation between the two. It kind of treats that education, that background information as, yeah, you just gotta learn this to get past the test. When in reality, you may not use every single thing that you learn in class or that you learn from things like this on every patient, but that builds that base layer, it creates that foundation that we make those in the moment decisions on and understanding it at a deeper level allows us to make better decisions. Even if you don't have to know, you know, ion exchanges in the field, knowing how that works even just a little bit begins to alter how you make your decisions. And so the more that you can expand yourself academically, the more you can make better decisions even though you don't use those little pieces every single day. So I, I, I challenge you to, to advance your academics, to, uh, to dive into the, the more technical side of things, not just skills practice and how do I do X, Y, and Z. So. Um, the real world technician uses an intelligent balance of academia, environmental awareness, and an experience. Um, and that's to not, not necessarily identify what is wrong with a patient, but what we're gonna do about it, so. So here's another quote. This is challenging you uh, to do the right thing. And so this is a quote from uh, David Cottrell. Uh, doing the right thing isn't always easy. In fact, sometimes it's real hard, but just remember that doing the right thing is always right. And that sounds cliche, but uh, I personally get a little bit of motivation and, and uh, you know, alignment from, from quotes like this. So uh, just think about that one. All right, so take a look at this, guys. It may not come through real clear. I didn't pick a really good image, but... Um, Imagine this, now I want you to cover up the dog, okay? Cover up the dog while you're looking at this. And uh, if you cover up the dog and you read, all cats have four legs, I have four legs, therefore I am a cat. Would you, uh, would you say that that is a logical statement? So just think about that for a second. Um, so looking at this, at this, if you cover up the dog, all cats have four legs, I have four legs, therefore I am a cat. Ask yourself, is that logical? Um, and then ask yourself that again while looking at the dog, bring the dog back into the picture. And while it still remains logical, the question is whether or not it's sound. So, so that's what we're gonna talk about, is how decision-making can seem right, even though it may not necessarily be. Is it moving? Awesome, one more. One more. I didn't set up the animations very well on this. Uh, so we're gonna talk about logical decision-making to start out. So logically, you could infer, right? We've all heard of inference or inductive reasoning, um, which is a method of reasoning in which the premises are viewed as supplying some of the evidence for the truth of the conclusion. And that's really important. Uh, I would challenge you to think about the, the last argument you had with another individual, right? We should all be able to do that pretty easily, right? Uh, so the last argument you had with another individual, and I'm going to go out on a limb here. I haven't been wrong yet in four years with this, but uh, I'm going to argue that one person in the argument did not have all the information. They were making an inductive uh, uh an inductive reasoning statement. They, they maybe had some truth of the conclusion, even though it might not have been right. And that's usually what we end up fighting for. That's the big difference uh, when we think inductively, when we infer ideas because we have some of the truth, but not all of the information. And so uh, 
think about that. I mean, do we want to make medical decisions with that kind of thinking? I don't think that that is the most appropriate approach to making decisions about our critical patients. So in contrast to that, there is deductive reasoning. And in deductive reasoning, the conclusion of a deductive argument is certain because it's the method of how you approach the process, right? So the truth of the conclusion of an inductive, an inference argument, might be probable. You could be right uh, based on the evidence given. So we'll walk through that just a little bit. Uh, so what does that mean? I'll give you an example. Pretend you have a bag and there's 20 black or white marbles in there. That's the information I'm giving you, okay? You pick out four. What can you infer about using an inductive reasoning statement? What can you infer about the total contents of that bag or uh, about what's in that bag? You know, oftentimes people come up with, you know, uh, you know, it's a ratio, so maybe it's, was it 15 and five? Uh, but do we know for certain? And that's really the big question is, although that is, a, that is a pretty accurate thing, and this is how all statistics and polls are done, uh, a lot of the papers that we base medicine on are through this, which is why we have to have repeated results in order to make changes, right? But uh, it's not necessarily correct. This is, when you think in, in inference, inductively, it's, that's when a group of individuals allows you to infer a guiding principle, something that you're gonna, you're gonna set your decisions to act on because it's probable, which is not entirely correct. Medicine isn't done through inductive reasoning. So instead, we can think of this in what I presented earlier, a deductive argument, a deductive argument. So deduce this. And that, although that has no bearing, I just thought that meme was funny. So what if one day Google was deleted and we couldn't Google what happened to Google? So. Um, so that, that has no bearing, that's just to add a laugh to this, this part of the kind of maybe boring part of the presentation. So um, in deductive reasoning, um, it's considered a top-down logic, right? It contrasts with inductive reasoning, which thinks about things from bottom up, right? Using just a little bit of information. In a deductive reasoning, in deductive reasoning, a conclusion is reached reductively by applying general rules which hold over the course uh, or over the entirety of a closed domain of discourse, narrowing the range under consideration until the only the conclusions are left. So what does that mean in English? What that means in English is we have a bunch of paths in front of us and using the knowledge we have at hand and every piece of information we gain, we eliminate what, the paths we don't want to go down, right? And so that all that's left is, is what we actually want to do. Instead of picking where we're going by affirming it, we're going to deny things using fact, using evidence, and using the tests that we have available. So how do we apply this to patient care? You know, when we're making a decision, we use those things, those tools that we have in our bags, um, in our knowledge, in our experience, our assessment skills, um, and all the, the expensive equipment a lot of us carry around, to uh, reduce the possibilities. Remember that first question, what are all the possible things that could be wrong with my patient? To reduce those items until all you have left is what you know to be true or what you know you cannot rule out. So, so what does that mean? With the same argument, I didn't change anything. This is there are 20 black or white marbles in a bag. You pick out four, uh, three are black, one is white. So how do we apply the same process but deductively, right? So the answer is you can't identify the total contents of the bag. You can only know your truth. And that's how I want you to approach patient care. So what do we know for certain? We know we have 20 marbles, right? That's truth, you can't argue that. We know there are 16 left, we can't argue that. We know that there are at least three that are black. We know at least one is white. And what's the next thing? We have to perform more tests, right? Can I be certain about the contents of that bag at this moment being only 25% aware or 20% aware of, of the contents? No, it's not enough, right? So we have to perform more tests in order to be certain about our decisions, especially if we're gonna intervene. Um, now, 
Now, I do want to say, just to interject there, if there is a life-threatening issue, a bleeding control issue, a breathing issue, jump in and do it. You know how to do those things, and we teach you how to do those. You've learned how to do those things. But when we get into the deeper parts of patient care, like medications or more advanced uh, treatments or um, how you're going to move somebody or, or what you're going to start or stop doing, you have to consider, um, you know, how you've reduced what could be wrong with that patient. And again, back to what I drew on the board, think about those decisions and how they affect the outcome, not how you leave this patient with the next person in the patient healthcare continuum. So, uh, next slide, please, or click, click, and... All right, so deductive logic is when an individual presents with information that reduces the likelihood of some things and increases the likelihood of others. It's running tests, which is all we're doing, okay? Medicine is done through deductive reasoning. Now, one of the issues with that is there are two ways to approach deductive reasoning, and one is a little bit better than the other. So up here right now we have uh, uh, Sir William Osler, who's considered the father of modern medicine. He was one of the original four founders of John Hopkins University. Um, and I love this quote. In fact, I stole this from Dr. Brandt as an inspirational quote, but um, he once said that the good physician treats the disease, the great physician, treats the patient who has the disease. You know, we're talking a lot about decision making and the ethereal problems with patients, but don't forget that the, it's the patient themselves. Look at what, how they present to you. Don't just follow the numbers you get from your machines um, and, and certainly don't just rely on experience, even if with that same patient, if you happen to run on them multiple times. Um, remember that we treat patients based on how they present um, and then we confirm those items with the tools that we have. So, next one. Logically, have you ever heard of the term, mind your P's and Q's? I don't know for certain if this is where it came from, but it sure sounds like it did. So, um, I'm gonna, we're gonna get a little deep here, so just bear with me. We'll get right back out of the weeds here in just a few minutes, so click for me. Um, there are two types of deductive reasoning, as I said. Um, and you know what, I just got a notice here. Uh, before we move any further, we're gonna throw up our logo screen. We're gonna take a quick five minute break so everybody can go to the bathroom and everything. Um, and, uh, and we'll be back in just a few minutes. Don't go anywhere. For those of you that had people that were interested in this but they missed the first piece of this, um, have them go ahead and get on. We only need to hit 70% of the attendance checks for any individual to give you credit. So even if you missed up till now, there are pl there's plenty of time uh, to hit the rest of the attendance checks and get credit. So please get a hold of the people that you work with um, and have them jump on, have them, have them continue attendance checks from here on out. This is our first time. We understand there's some technical difficulties and we'll be, um, we'll be aware of what we need to, to advise in the beginning of the next one. But if you need to, go ahead and chat with Jessica on the stream let her know that you're here and that you just got on and we'll make sure that we get you those hours. This is not to be ruthless with the hours. This is your benefit. This is for your benefit. So we want to make sure that we give you uh, um, all the opportunity to gain some CEUs. We just have to meet a few parameters there. So, so uh, make sure you log in, tell your people, have them do the attendance checks. And I am going a little long-winded here so that you have the time to get a hold of those people. So hopefully we address that issue. Has there been any other uh, questions I need to address at the moment. No? Okay. Excellent. So, um, can we go to a little box and we're going to get started here again, folks. All right. So, um, back to this. Um, if you weren't with us, that's okay. Uh, you can watch the first part afterward just to catch up, but just follow along. You'll, you'll stay right in line. We are going to get a little bit in the weeds here for a minute, so just bear with me, okay? So, logically, mind your P's and Q's. We talked about deductive reasoning and, and, and thinking about patient care decisions by eliminating uh, the things that we know to be certain uh, as not going on with our patient, things that we can get rid of using the tests and the experience and uh, the skills that we have to eliminate things we know is not affecting our patients so that we're only dealing 
with that which uh, is really happening or has a probability with our patient. And then of course we want to order that based on risk, right? So we'll get more into that in, in, a, in a little bit, but how we make those decisions is really important. So we want to use deductive reasoning. There are though two ways to uh, use deductive reasoning. And so the first way is called modus ponens, and this is Latin, and it means the method of affirming. And again, we're, getting the, we're gonna get in the weeds a little bit here, and then I'm gonna bring it back to medicine so you understand. Um, and this is expressed as if P, then Q. You can think of it as if problem, then question, right? Um, or it's expressed as P, therefore Q. So an example would be, if you have a password, then you can log on the network. Seems to make sense, right? Um, or in medicine, if you have appendicitis, then you have right lower quadrant abdominal pain. I know that's not true 100% of the time, but you can see the logic in what I'm saying, right? So the problem is, go ahead, uh, are those examples true? Um, we have to question, like we did with the, if you were here, the dog picture that we And how sound the argument is plays a big role. Um, so a valid and sound argument would be all men are mortal. William is a man, therefore William is immortal. There's only one variable in there and we've addressed it. So it's valid and sound. A valid but unsound argument is all boys eat apple. Ron eats apple, therefore Ron is a boy because we failed to address all the variables. So that although it sounds logical, and it is, it is not a sound argument. So hopefully you understand what I'm talking about. If not, ask some questions. Um, I'd love to address some questions, so feel free, fire them away, and we'll address them as they come, so no worries. Remember, we are in about a minute delay. Um, so the, if you have a password, then you can log onto the network. Um, then, uh, that's not entirely sound, because what if you have the wrong password, right? We just said a password or the password, right? Um, what if you're on the wrong network? So we didn't address all the variables. Um, and I know that sounds really technical, but that's kind of what we have to do in medicine. We do have to think beyond just what we see right in front of us, in front of us and think about all of the variables that could be happening with our patient, with this situation, with what's going on. So. Um, there is the alternative side. So that first one was the method of affirming. We were stating what, uh, you know, in an affirmation, what is, right? So we're going to approach this from a different way. Um, and this one, the second one, is called uh, modus tollens. If you accept modus ponens, the first one, the method of affirming, if P, then Q, then you must accept the contraposition, and you don't have to know what all that is, we're just gonna leave it up there so you can kind of read how that works. But you can take the, sta the same statement, an affirmative statement, and turn it into a negative statement. Um, and it still holds true. So the, you swap the statements, the P and the Q, so like if password, then network, or if appendicitis, then right lower quadrant abdominal pain, we just switch those, okay? Um, then we negate all the statements. So if it was positive, we make it negative. If it was negative, we make it positive. So if it becomes it was, it becomes it is not. And that's what I mean by that. And then anytime you see an and or an or in any statement, we just swap those. So if it's A and B equals C, it would become uh, not C equals uh, not A or B. Or yeah, it's not A or not B. There we go. So hopefully I confused you completely with that one. Get a chuckle out of that. Um, but this is expressed as if not Q, see how we moved it backwards, then not P or not Q, therefore not P. So, um, and again, I know we're in the weeds here for a second, but we're going to get out of that. So, so an example would be, uh, we're going to talk about the modus ponens again. Remember, this is the affirming one from the last slide. If you have appendicitis, then you have right lower quadrant abdominal pain. Notice the affirmation there. So if we were to switch that, if we were to contrapose that into the method of denying, known as modus tollens, it would be, if you do not have right lower quadrant abdominal pain, then you do not have appendicitis. And we know that's not a, true 100% of the time, right? I'm aware of that. But if you think about that between the two, that second one, that method of denying, 
that is the more accurate choice. And, uh, and this is taught in law school. This is what the basis of Western law is based on. Um, everything is a negative until proven otherwise, right? Just like innocent until proven guilty, right? So if you do not have right lower quadrant abdominal pain, then you do not have appendicitis. So that's the modus tollens. This is how medicine is done. You have to reduce your options using the tools you have available to you. And then you apply what you know in a, in a method of denying. If you don't have this, then you don't have this, right? If I don't see this, it can't be this, right? And that's how we approach things. The positive test uh, does not necessarily mean presence of whatever it is, right? If you see ST elevation for my medics out there, if you see ST elevation on a 12 lead, do they have a heart attack? Are they dealing with an MI? Not necessarily, right? But if you can rule it out, we can, for the most part, safely rule it out. There's other tests we want to do to be more sure, but that's the key. Other tests to be more sure, right? We talked about the marbles earlier, and you had to perform more tests because 20% accuracy is not enough. So that's what we're going to talk about next. I hope I have that slide in the right order. Yes, I do. Awesome. So what is this? I don't even. So we'll catch you up, and we'll bring this back to medicine a little bit here. So sensitivity is what I'm talking about. When I say we're not 100% on that every time, what we're dealing with is sensitivity. And you've probably heard of sensitivity in a study, in, you know, in studies, you see a little SN and then a percentage. And it's, what it's saying is the true positive rate of a test, how often the test is right. So what in the world is sensitivity? Uh, Sensitivity is the true positive rate. It's also known as the recall. It's also known as the probability of detection. So sensitivity measures the proportion of actual positives that are correctly identified. And, and just to bring that down to the, the coloring book level, what does that mean in English? Key points, when you say it is and you are right. That's your sensitivity, and it's expressed as a percentage, kind of like when you take a test, right? We've been trained on this. You've been tested like this your whole life. Uh, you've been trained on this a bunch. You take a test, and you get a grade, right? Usually a percentage. So that percentage is your sensitivity to the material presented in the test. Not necessarily the course, because the test doesn't cover everything, but to what's in the test, that's your sensitivity. So when you get a grade, it's your sensitivity. Think of that in the realm of patient care. So the percentage that you get, or I'm sorry, the, the test that you take has a percentage of accuracy for it being right. So if it tells you, if the test tells you whatever it is you're testing for is positive, and we'll use the 12 lead again as an example. Uh, if, it, if you see elevation in two contiguous leads greater than one millimeter, blah, 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 um, that's a positive test, but it only has a level of sensitivity. It is not 100%, just like the, Afri uh, the negative statement on the appendicitis. And so, go ahead, go to the next one. So, um, you know, that makes a lot of sense. We've dealt with sensitivity a lot in our lives and how we measure that. Um, but there is a second half to that. And the second half to that is specificity. And just to reiterate, I just want to, if, if anybody's new on here, go ahead and hit the like button for us. That helps us. Uh, it helps get our, our channel out there. Um, and hit subscribe on our YouTube channel. Hit the little bell to subscribe, and that will alert you whenever we post new videos. And we post little stuff, big keynotes, and then we're going to do this monthly. So, Yeah, yeah, all right. Oh, hold on. All right, cool. I'm back with you. All right, so specificity, back into the PowerPoint here. Um, what in the world is specificity? So specificity is, is, you could think of it as the opposite of sensitivity, right? So specificity is the true negative rate. It's, it's, it also tells you, it is not, but it tells you about the cry wolf rate. So, and what I mean by that is, Specificity measures the proportion of actual negatives that are correctly identified. So what does that mean in English? Just like the last slide, we're going to talk about it at the coloring book level where I can actually understand it. 
Uh, it's when you say it isn't, when a test tells you it's not, and it's right, or you're right. When you say it's not, and you're right. That's your specificity, your ability to detect false, or, or your, ability, your ability to detect when things are not, right? Um, and the difference, because it's expressed as a percentage, right? So the difference between sensitivity, your sensitivity, uh, I'm sorry, your specificity, specificity uh, of a test, of a decision, um, and one, that difference in there, that is what we call the cry wolf rate. So, and to give this a little more visual appeal so you understand how my brain works and, and put some visuals to this, uh, we're going we're gonna to show the math side of it. So this is not actually how it works. They don't come together like this, but, but in achieving one, which is 100%, right? Um, go ahead and click. And so if we look at sensitivity, say a test that you perform um, or a piece of knowledge that you know presents a certain way with a patient, say that is 82% sensitive. That means 82% of the time, when you say it is, it is, right? But that does mean it's not 100%. So just like a 12 lead or, or any other tests that we perform, um, there is a level of sensitivity. So with, in this case, you would miss 18% of the time, right? And that's okay, but that just means that we have to perform other tests to get over that threshold where we know we're 100% sure, right? Or at least to the best of our ability, right? Because uh, the tests, uh, the sensitivity of, sensitivity of tests is proven over time, right? Um, now on the other side, still trying to get to one, specificity, uh, say when it says it's not, and, it, and, and you're correct, or the test is correct that it is not, say it has a specificity of 97%. What that means is 3% of the time uh, it is incorrect. It's a cry wolf rate, okay? And that's what we're getting at. So I know that's a little bit in the weeds. Hopefully you're tracking with that. Feel free to, to uh, chat with us, ask any questions that you have. Um, again, we're on a, about a one minute delay, but uh, uh, but that's sensitivity and specificity. And we're going to talk a little bit more into how we apply that to actual decisions in the field because this information doesn't help you in like, what do I do when I'm looking at somebody, right? So the key with this, and this, I don't know if this comes from somebody else, but Dr. Brandt himself has said this a thousand times and it's really hit home for me personally, is uh, you do not have to be right, okay? You do not have to be right in what you do but you cannot be wrong. So think about that for a second. How does that, how does that apply to when you make decisions about your patients? When you, have enough, when you have information coming in, asking questions from family, observing things on the scene, talking with other first responders, uh, talking with EMS professionals or vice versa, law enforcement, um, family, friends, neighbors, the environment, the weather, all these pieces of information, you're gonna make decisions based off of all that. And you're gonna do it in split seconds. And the more experienced you are, the faster it happens. But you, you do not have to be right, but you cannot be wrong. And all that means is that you have to use these tests. You don't have to know the individual specificity and sensitivity of every test out there. You're not, I don't know it, you're not gonna know it but you have to have a, a general understanding of how accurate that is. Do we call, as for my medics out there, do we call an MI solely on a 12 lead? Generally, no. We're generally gonna include some other pieces of, of tests, of information that increase our sensitivity well over that 100% mark. So if we have somebody who presents, uh, you know, kind of shocky, right, with pale skin, diaphoretic, really sweaty skin, right? And they're cool and they're clammy. Um, and you walk in and you're like, damn, that guy's not looking good right now, right? So, uh, so uh, that in addition to the 12 lead, the elevation um, and anything else that you can gather, like having chest pain, um, a history, all of these things add in to a greater sensitivity that pushes us over that 100% mark. But all those things together, you can make a confident decision that you're, you're dealing with a patient who might have an MI, right? So you don't have to be right, but you can't be wrong. 
meaning that you got to have the sensitivity to say uh, that what, what you think it is, is, or that what you have left in what we call a differential diagnosis um, has been properly assessed, right? So if you're going to pick a diagnosis for your patient, be careful, right? Like we talked in the very beginning, for those of you that were with us, uh, like we talked in the very beginning, uh, it's not just one thing. You don't want to look for that one item that could be wrong with your patient. We want to look at all the things that could be wrong with our patient. So, so what is a differential diagnosis? A differential diagnosis. Because when you pick one thing, that's a diagnosis, right? And generally, we know we're not supposed to do that in the field. It's not that we're not supposed to. It's that we can't. We don't have enough information to tr truly just diagnose somebody. Diagnoses are usually reached at discharge for a patient when they leave the end of the, the uh, uh, patient care continuum, right? Uh, so a differential diagnosis, think of it as a list, right? It's a basket of all the things you can't get rid of, right? They still loom over you because they present some risk to the patient and there's still some level of probability. So hopefully that makes sense. A differential diagnosis is never one item, ever. It is a list of all the things that using our deductive reasoning that we're going to use from now on, right? Uh, using your deductive reasoning, you can't eliminate, right? Because you don't have to be right, but you can't be wrong. You can't just eliminate it, right? So I hope you like ordered lists. I talked about it before. Everything that's in a list is, is based on importance. One's more important than two and so on. So uh, as we move forward, we're going to talk a bit more about that. All right, so let's make this real simple. I'm gonna step away from differential diagnosis, let you kind of simmer on that for a second. And I wanna to talk to you about what actually hurts people because and, and what leads to uh, patient demise and critical patients because that really gives us the basis to determine our differential diagnosis, okay? So let's make this real simple. There are only four things, four things that kill patients. That's it. There's only four things total that kill patients. And think about that, it's that simple. Now I'm a very analytical person, so I break things down into lists, um, and hopefully this helps people who think the way I do, but limiting things down to what, uh, to as small as possible helps me think a little clearer, right? So if you think about this, there are only four things that kill patients. And so we'll interject a little uh, uh, modus ponens, a little modus tollens, right? So if your emergency patient is dying, then it is one of these four, right? And if it is not one of these four, your emergency patient is not dying. See what we did there? We went positive and negative on it. So it is your job, and, and I really encourage you, write these down if you haven't heard this before, okay? So it is your job to ensure your patients have, number one, most important, right? An intact and adequate circulatory system, okay? Uh, number two, an intact and adequate respiratory ventilatory system, okay? So in order, and the remaining two is perfusion of oxygen and perfusion of glucose. That's it. Even when a terminally ill patient begins to uh, reach demise um, in trauma patients, in, in medical patients, all patients, all humans, it's when one of these four or multitudes of these four are affected that we, that we become critical. We have critical patients, that's when they die. It's the only way that patients actually fail. So we're gonna break these down a little bit one by one. So write them down if you want. Um, all right, next slide. Next slide. Um, oh, yep. So just a little visual here, because I'm not as funny as this guy. But the core four, this is what we call the core four. And uh, it's just a little name that we put out there. So if you hear anybody uh, with Coxymes talking about the core four, they've been through this in their training, especially a lot of our new recruits. And for those of you that haven't had uh, the benefit of coming through, this is what we talk about with our new recruits. So um, the core four. So breaking it down, the first one is an intact and adequate circulatory system, right? So think of the uh, circulatory system as a system, uh, as a self-contained fluid pump and pipes. So with that, here's another order list, ready? You gotta have three things to ensure that that is intact and adequate, okay? So the first one, oh, I love this video, or this visual here too. Um, 
The first one is a pump. You gotta have a pump, right? So that's our heart. You gotta have a pump, something to move the fluid through, right? I just hit my mic. Did I mess up audio at all? Okay, all right. Uh, so you gotta have pipes. So you gotta have a vascular system that takes the contents of, of, of what's going through that system throughout the body, right? And number three, you have to have product, right? Blood. You have to have red blood cells specifically and then the fluid that they travel through so that we maintain the perfusion pressure, the blood pressure to get it where it needs to go, right? So there are only five ways the circulatory system fails to be intact and it affects those three, the, the pump, pipes, and product. And that's in order, what's most important. And that order is how quickly it will affect somebody, um, how quickly they will reach demise, uh, meaning that if there is a problem with the pump, they will die faster than if there is a problem with the pipes, than if there is a problem with the product, right? And, and I know there's anecdotal cases you can claim uh, one's higher than the other, but in general, your heart is the most important, having the structure in place and then the blood is, is the order. So that being said, the number one, again, another ordered list here, the number one uh, problem um, that would cause the circulatory system to fail to be intact and adequate is uh, container failure. We can think of this as breaks, stops, and clogs, okay? Um, number two, and we'll dive even into these a little bit, okay? Number two is not having enough fluid, right? Not having enough product there, right? Number three, the container becomes too big, right? The, uh, the pipes become bigger. It's a closed system, right? So it's self-contained. So if you make the container bigger, suddenly the volume drops. So that's an important piece. That's why it's number three. Number four, you can have too much fluid. Right? We've seen those patients who are fluid overloaded, that can cause problems and it can, it can jam the system up a little bit. And then number five, the only five ways that, that this fails to be intact and adequate is the container becomes too small. So those are the only ways that, the, that our circulatory system fails to be intact and adequate. So uh, for me, this was an epiphany moment to realize that there's only four things that kill people and in the first one, there's only five things that can go wrong. I just have to mitigate those. So that's, that's uh, what I really like about this topic. So uh, we'll dive into it a little bit here. So um, moving on to the, the ventilatory respiratory system, it's very similar, but remember this is number two. So um, it is a balloon inside of a box. Think of it that way, right? So there's only so much space there, right? Um, so you must have, can you guess what they are? You must have a pump, pipes, and product. Same thing, right? You gotta have a way to move, you gotta have a place to put it, and you gotta have something to move, right? The benefit of this one is there's not five things, there's only three things that can go wrong with the ventilatory system in general, right? First is the same thing, it's container failure, breaks, stops, and clogs, right? Number two is mechanical suppression, right? Um, if, if somebody had a significant blunt trauma and they have multiple fractures to their chest, they're not gonna breathe. You're gonna have to help them. And being aware of that with chest trauma, blunt chest trauma, um, and then there's even complications that can arise from that. Um, or if they had, you know, you're dealing with a car accident and say something like a vehicle or debris or something is resting on top of a patient, they're not gonna have the ability to breathe. Um, or maybe uh, they're, they've become paralyzed, or maybe uh, if you're a medic, maybe you've used sedatives or something. If they don't have the ability to breathe, they're not going to. And I know that sounds obvious, but you gotta think about these things, okay? And then number three, using the wrong gases. It seems obvious, but it's important that we get the right gases into our lungs, right? And that, of course, the big ones we deal with is carbon dioxide, which we'll talk about in a whole nother a virtual event with you guys. And then, of course, the obvious one, oxygen, right? So, the wrong gases. Those are the only three ways that uh, the ventilatory system fails to be intact and adequate, right? So, uh, breaking it down, the perfusion of oxygen. Um, oxygen is the correct gas, right? We just talked about that, but having the right amount is what's key. So, if we look at the composition of the atmosphere, 
uh, oxygen is not everything we breathe. In fact, the majority of it is nitrogen, about 78%. I think this is all at sea level, but about 78%. Oxygen only occupies about 20% of the air, right? And then there's a bunch of other gases and stuff that make up the rest and a little bit of water. And this is why we supplement oxygen because uh, the O2 that we carry in our green bottles is 100% oxygen. So that helps, you know, if there's a failure in the delivery system inside of a person, then we're providing the maximum amount of oxygen so that we can get it into the tissues and the cells and the organs as needed. Uh, but if we just used room air, um, there's only, or nitrogen occupies the biggest chunk of that, right? Um, and not all the time is that bad. We use a couple of feedback mechanisms to see where we're at. One is measuring end tidal CO2 if you have that capability. And then uh, almost everybody carries a pulse oximeter. Or you can buy them at Walgreens. It's like 20 or $30, right? Or I'm not going to promote a brand. You can buy it at any pharmacy anywhere, right? Um, and they're just a finger probe. And of course, you know, for those that work on the ambulance, they're on our monitors. There's some independent ones, but... Um, we measure those things between, or we measure that through those two tests, right? So if you are unsure about how much oxygen somebody's giving, getting, then I encourage you to give them more if you have that capability, right? And it's not in volume, it's in the correct gas, right? So that's just using supplemental oxygen, not overinflating a, a BVM or anything. That's what I'm getting at, just so you know and ensure that it gets where it needs to go. And so that's just a reminder to ensure that circulation is occurring, right? Um, so high flow, uh, just so you guys know, I know you, some of you probably heard this, but high flow oxygen for an extended period, period of time in very specific patient populations can lead to a little bit of an issue. Uh, but the goal is not 100%, right? We're not trying to get to our SpO2 our O2 saturations as 100%. We're, we're looking to, and specifically with our protocols, we want to ensure perfusion. So we kind of look for 94%, right? And then of course, we, we don't just use one item. We look at our patient too, right? So we're looking at their skin, uh, their skin condition. We look at their mentation, how our patients respond to us, how they talk and interact with us um, and their environment, how, how uh, oriented they are. They may be able to look around, but are they confused? That's a pretty good sign they're not getting enough. Um, if you do have you know, 94% or more on your SpO2, on uh, your saturations, and you're still dealing with those other problems, that may lead you down a different path to there, there being more stuff, right? But again, we don't treat one item, right? That's what we're talking about, is we're thinking about all the things that could go wrong with our patient, right? So that's the perfusion of oxygen. Um, Next is the perfusion of glucose. And some of you may remember uh, uh, Wilford Brimley did a long uh, uh, campaign to educate the public about diabetes. There's a few funny memes out there. This is one I found for you. But um, glucose, blood glucose levels, if you have that capability, I understand if you're a first responder agency, you may not have that capability. Uh, but blood glucose levels are the easiest thing to check for next to circulation and breathing. And so never forget that. That's always something that you have to pay attention to. It's one of the core four items to pay attention to so that we don't have a patient demise or, or a decline in patient condition or even death, right? So um, let's go forward here. Uh, ensure the perfusion of glucose, thus completing the core four requirements. So just to recap, we only had four, right? We have the intact and adequate uh, circulatory system, an intact and adequate ventilatory system, right? The perfusion of oxygen and the perfusion of glucose. Those are the only four things that kill patients. And then if you talk operationally, we do have to add in, uh, you know, how we handle our patients. We have to add in um, accurate and timely information to the next person to receive them in the patient care continuum and don't sit with patients. Just like blood, stasis causes problems. So keep them moving, right? Um, so you should always be headed to the next level of care and not stopped, right? Except for a few cases where it's prescribed, right? right? Like we work a cardiac arrest on scene if we deal with that, right? But we try to move them if we, if we know we're starting to have a, a, an upward benefit, right? So um, 
supplement glucose or find someone who can if you know that there's a problem or you suspect it, right? You suspect that there's a problem. The test is there. The sensitivity is there. So um, as we move forward with this, so um, let's tie those two together, right? Let's tie our differential di diagnosis information together, um, our, our logical uh, thinking, our deductive reasoning, and our core four, and pull those all together. And we're going to use a system that we call the OODA loop. And you can look up the origins of all that, but it's a pretty effective way to make decisions, right? Because um, we make thousands of decisions with every single patient, thousands of them. Every little thing we do is another decision. So I'm going to refer to those as OODA loops. And I know it sounds funny, but it's an OODA loop, okay? And so that's an acronym that stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, and act. It's the steps in which we make decisions, right? So the first piece of that, which you're all very familiar with, is we have to observe what's going on with our patient, right? We have to gain information. There's, uh, there's things like we have on the slide here. We have G GCS. We have uh, sample questions that, that in our EMT teaches you, you know, signs, uh, symptoms, allergies, medications, things like that. Onset, provocation, the OPQRSTs past medical history of the patient, surgical history of the patient, uh, GPS, meaning our location, how far are we from a, an appropriate facility, right? How far are we from the next uh, EMS agency? How, you know, what is the weather like? What, are we down in a ravine? Do we have to have extrication measures? Are they stuck in a car? There's, there's location information. Um, so it's a lot of that scene information, right? And then the direct stuff that we get specifically from the patient that we buy a bunch of fancy stuff for, right? So there's vitals, there's blood pressure, there's heart rate. There's different, separate, remember, pulse rate is different than heart rate. Heart rate's what a machine tells you, pulse rate's what you can feel, right? So there's heart rate, pulse rate, respiratory rate, in tidal CO2, which is carbon dioxide exhaled from the body, right? We get four leads and 12 lead EKGs to look at a patient's heart. Uh, we take their glucose, important, right? We just talked about that. Um, temperature, uh, like I said, blood pressure, and a big one, skin condition and mentation, right? And that's not everything. That's not, by no means comprehensive, but it's the information that you can gain, what you can observe from the patient, from your tools, from your experience, from the scene, everything, right? So we take in all this information, and that's our observation phase. We take all of that, and we put it through a core four filter. And I say a core four filter by understanding what we just went over with the core four. Uh, you, you kind of identify, am I dealing with anything that is life threatening, right? Because the core four is all the things that will kill a patient, right? So we, we decide, is any of this that I'm observing leading me to the conclusion that there could be any truth about there being a life threatening condition, right? Is any of the core four affected by what I'm observing, right? And so we have to make sure that our assessments are, are complete, they're comprehensive, but also quick, right? Remember, we're fighting time at all times. Um, so we put it through that core four filter just to orient ourselves. And that's so like, you know, if you notice somebody's in cardiac arrest or they're not perfusing well enough, at the very least, you don't even have to feel for a pulse necessarily. If somebody's not breathing right and they're not responding to you, you can uh, probably assume that they are, uh, they're not perfusing appropriately, especially if you have other things like skin uh, presentation is bad, uh, and just start CPR. The worst thing that's gonna happen is they're gonna tell you, ow, and then you did a good job, that's a win, right? Um, so we put it through the core four filter, and the next one is orient. And this is the most important phase of our decision making. It really is. And I think this is where we all, myself included, can really uh, take the time to develop ourselves, to build those skills a little bigger than the challenges, right? Um, because this can always be improved. It's like sweeping, right? Easy to learn, but impossible to master. So uh, we take all that information, we've addressed the life threats, and then we, we, we filter it. We take we build our differential diagnosis list, right? It's not one thing, it's a list. And so we assess the probability of this occurring in our patient, whatever it is that we're, we're trying to eliminate, right? Um, a potential diagnosis. And then we assess the risk to our patient. Will it kill them? Will it hurt them? Will it just kind of make them mad, right? Um, and then we take our medical knowledge. We take uh, the experience that we have. 
you know, and lean on your people who are more experienced. They, you know, there is a lot of value in seeing numbers of patients, right? And practicing this over and over. We take the information that we have at hand, all that information from the observation phase and core four, um, and, and we take our workflow that we're currently using, our relationship with our partners and our fellow responders, um, and, and you, have, you have to also be aware of cultural information as well, too. Um, we live in a very diverse community, and not all cultures communicate the same. So if you're asking questions, be aware of the, the cultures of the patient and their family. Um, and may, you can maybe adjust to be more sensitive to gain more information or, or realize how the situation occurred that they are in. So. Um, so we take all that to orient, that's all the purpose of that, the end state of that, that we're trying to reach is a list of our diagnoses, a differential diagnosis of the things that we have yet so far not been able to eliminate using deductive reasoning, right? So it's all the things that could be wrong with our patient. That is the answer to the very first question, right? What are all the things that could be wrong with my patient? What's the risk to them and what's the probability? And we rank them um, in the order that we want to start attacking that problem, right? So it tells us, you know, the thing at the top of the list, what's going to kill them the fastest, has the highest risk, the highest likelihood, uh, the shortest amount of time until it causes a problem, and what do I have in my toolbox to either uh, help eliminate that, you know, remove some of the, the you, you know, have a, uh, a, a test that tells us that it doesn't exist or allows us to eliminate it or multiple things, um, it, that kind of guides us on what we're going to do next, right? So if we have, uh, you know, we have somebody with chest pain, right? This is, this is the process we go through that allows the next person to ask, you know, how does it feel? Uh, when did it start? It's the thing that leads you to the next item that will give you more observation criteria, right? And then we take all of that, we put it together with our medical knowledge, our medical experience. Pathophysiology is huge and it's free. The internet is at your fingertips. Half of you are on your phone right now, I guarantee it. So pathophysiology and the understanding of how processes work through the body is important, right? And you can learn these in little tidbits. Uh, we use Khan Academy here a lot. It's like five minute videos and we make a few of our own too. So, so look for those. Uh, but medical experience, knowledge, pathophysiology, the information that we have through observations and orienting that list allow us to make the next decision. What are we going to do next and what do we want to know, right? And then guess what? We make the decision, right? That's the next thing. Uh, we decide, we understand what our treatments are and we decide, right? Now when we make that decision, we do have to mitigate our risk, right? Just because it's available doesn't mean we should, right? And just because we know how doesn't mean it's the most appropriate, right? Um, we have to mitigate our risk. We have to understand the global view of this patient, right, or this situation. And then a big thing is we have to balance our confidence in the skill, our confidence with, uh, with the situation, and our humility, right? We don't act out of ego. We don't do something just so we can say we did, right? We do what's best for those who need us, right? The vision of Cox Health, all right? And then lastly, we act, right? We move. We, we may, we've processed all this information. And so hopefully, if you start to take this approach in your care, in your life, uh, you stop, um, you stop being paralyzed by analysis, that paralysis by analysis, right? So that's, that's how we work through a decision. All right, guys, so we have a attendance check. So go ahead and click that link that's pinned to the top of the chat. And in that chat, this is a really easy code that you're going to put in there. And then your license number, or just put, I don't have a license if you don't have one. Um, and it's 33000, okay? So I'll give you a few seconds. Few, few seconds to, to pull that up and enter it so you don't lose me while you're doing that. What is the current time? Okay. And just so you guys know, if you're looking for a break, we got one coming in about nine minutes, okay? So I'm just going to get through a little bit more 
before we start our, uh, our next break. Uh, don't be shy. If you have any questions, throw them up here. If you have questions directly for me or Dr. Brandt, um, we'll see them. We got a TV down here. We can see what's, what you guys are talking about. So uh, throw them our way. Remember, there is about a one minute delay, so it'll take us a second to get to them, but we will answer your questions. And we will do a live Q&A uh, probably more with Brant who you want to talk to, but both of us will be here to, to answer any questions at the very end of this uh, before you take your test. So you can't ask for the answer though. All right, so we good to get started again? Awesome, all right, so we're gonna keep going here guys. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, all right, so circulatory system failures, right? So we, we kind of did a one over the world over the core four. We're gonna, we're gonna, I'm not gonna dive into all of them, but I am gonna dive into the circulatory system. So you kind of get an understanding of the next level of inception on this, okay? So let's bring it back to the in intact and adequate circulatory system, shall we? So uh, we have to remember, I'll give you some hints here, okay? So we have to remember that bleeds are worse than blocks, right? In general, they're gonna, they're gonna cause problems in time for our patients faster than blocks. And we're talking about blood moving through the body, right? Uh, and container uh, failures, right? So bleeds are worse than blocks. So think about this with me. Usually this is done in a classroom, so there's a lot of interaction. So I'm gonna pause every now and then to give you guys a, a chance to kind of think about this and just, just kind of go with it with me, all right? So um, think about this. What are the three IDLH organs and in what order? And that means immediate danger to life and health, right? So what are the three organs, should they fail, that are gonna injure or kill uh, a patient a or cause a patient to go into demise or, or uh, become critical? And in what order, right? Think about time, think about all the things. So, uh, so just think about that. Kind of get a list in your head. And, and there's a bunch of good opinions out there. And I will tell you, this is simply just an opinion. Um, this is not like hard facts, but but the order that I put into this, um, I'll explain my why, so you understand why I think that way. Uh, but let's click one more time. We'll see the options here. So usually people say uh, the brain, the heart, the lungs, those three are usually the first three. And if you were thinking those, you were right on track. So um, the difference is though, it, order matters obviously for me, right? So order matters. Based on time, what is gonna hurt or kill or injure a patient faster, right? Uh, so if we were to have an issue with the lungs or the heart or the brain, what's going to do it faster? What's the order that you think it is? So just take a second and kind of think about that, right? Uh, there's a lot of variables you can throw in there. There's a lot of good opinions. I've heard some really excellent ex explanations for people um, as to which one they choose. But if you've got one set in your head, okay, I'm going to show you mine here. So um, clicking forward, we have heart, then brain, then lungs, right? And that's the order that I picked. Um, and click one more time, I think I put up a, a reason. So my why is because, you know, the heart, if you, if you understand the pathophysiology of it, it has a level of, uh, or it has this neat feature that we call automaticity. And if you haven't heard that word, it just means that the, the cells, the muscle cells inside the heart create their own electricity, right? So if you have the right electrolytes, the stuff you get from like Powerade and stuff, right? Potassium, calcium, uh, sodium, those type of things, it creates its own electrical charge, which allows the muscle to contract, right? The beat of our heart that pushes blood through our body. It does it by itself. And, and bear with me a little bit, but to a point, you could take the heart out of the body and as long as you feed it nutrients, it will continue to pump, right? It doesn't necessarily need anything to drive it. And so it is semi-independent, right? And so that's why I put it at the top. Um, because it controls a lot of things and it feeds a lot of things, but it's kind of independent, it would be really bad if we lost our heart or if our heart had any damage to it or any issues, right? So I put it at the top of the list based on how fast somebody will be injured or killed uh, if there's a problem with the heart, right? So that's a big deal. I put the the uh, brain next, and I wrote it backwards, but I put the brain next, I guess it's up here for you guys, but I put the brain next uh, because it, it absolutely depends on the heart to feed it, right? 
So the heart is kind of independent. It feeds the brain, and the brain kind of gives some feedback. Hey, faster, slower, I'm hungry, right? So the brain depends on the heart. And then the lungs, you know, they also depend on the heart. They require nutrients. They have to get that blood. Um, it's a part of your cardiovascular system to, to move uh, your blood and oxygen around. But your lungs and how they operate are, are fully driven by your brain, right? They don't do anything by themselves. So in order, if you lost your heart, it would be worse than losing your brain than, than losing your lungs. Function, I mean, right? So that's the order I put it in. That's solely my opinion, but that's my why, okay? So uh, some, I've heard some really good competing opinions out there, but, you know, uh, keep up with your bad self on those. So, uh, But that's my opinion, and I'm going to go off of this one as we continue through this, okay? So, so if we think about this, if we know that bleeds are worse than blocks and the heart is the most time critical organ, right? Then what is the, and this is in the cardiovascular system, which we know is at number one, right? In our core four, what's gonna hurt patients the fastest? Then what's some differential diagnosis categories that we can think of as the most important things to eliminate when we're doing our initial patient assessments, when we don't know anything else about our patient, the androgynous patient, right? So the heart bleed would be the first thing to consider. So can you guys think what a heart bleed would be? And not as much feedback in a virtual, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, hemorrhages, right? It's bleeds, right? So I'm gonna split these into two. Um, I'm gonna say 1A, is an external hemorrhage. And mostly because if you have blood leaving the body, it's really hard to scoop it up and put it back in, right? Um, and generally when you have blood leaving the body, especially in a critical way, uh, it's a pretty quick thing. You can, you can uh, depending on the, the vessel that's been lacerated or injured, you can bleed out in as little as three minutes, right? So, um, and then our, my 1B is an internal hemorrhage. And I, and I know there can be, you know, anecdotal things that cause patients to die faster or get injured faster with an internal hemorrhage, but I say this generally, right? In general, external hemorrhages are much worse than internal hemorrhages. And part of that is because, you know, if I have a pretty significant cut on my hand or an extremity, we know we can tourniquet that off, we can stop it uh, uh, fairly easy, but you have to catch it in time, right? But, but internal stuff, it has the potential to cavitate a little bit. And that means like the muscles and the structure of the body can maybe even contain it a little bit. There's cases where it can't, and that's why it's, you know, number two, way up on the list. But uh, internal hemorrhage, I do put below external hemorrhage, right? But, but overall, major hemorrhages are the biggest problem, right? And that's the fastest thing that kills people. So when we approach our patients, that's the first thing we want to assess for. And that's not just visual, right? Because there could be, you know, I'll be very frank with this, you know, we deal with significant things in our responses. There could be somebody with a gunshot wound and you miss another penetration, penetrating hole on the backside of the patient facing the ground. So we do have to do full assessments. We do that the appropriate way, the way you've been trained, but make sure that you're, you know, you're looking and feeling and looking for blood and making sure that we don't have those major external ones, which are fairly easy to recognize, right? and those major internal ones. So how do we recognize that? We look at mentation, we look at skin, uh, we look at how the patient presents, right? Um, and I'm gonna stop on the hemorrhage stuff there because we are gonna take a quick five minute break. So uh, bear with us, come back, don't lose it, and we'll see you in about five minutes, all right guys? All right. All right, guys, hopefully you can hear me. I, I think we're back now. Um, real quick, just to remind you guys again, make sure you hit like underneath our video. It, uh, I don't know where I am on screen, but I think it's down over here. Um, and make sure that you hit subscribe so that you get the posts when we push these videos out along with our other videos and educational um, you know, offerings that we do. So um, with that, hopefully you guys are all back with us and we're going to continue on with the PowerPoint. So we'll go full screen with that and continue on. Hold, okay. All right, we should be good, I'm hearing. So is the audio okay? Cool. All right. So 
Uh, from what I understand, I'm in a little box next to the, the PowerPoint now. So um, is it blocking anything with the list here? No. Okay, excellent. So, um, so we were talking about circulatory system failures. We were talking about how, um, you know, this is the, the most important piece of the core four that can injure or kill patients, right? Um, and we talked about the three IDLH organs, which is immediate danger to life and health, right? And that's based on the core four as well. Um, and then I just gave you a little tidbit of information, and that is that uh, bleeds are worse than blocks, right? And just in general, in time, it's going to injure a patient faster, right? So that's just a little piece of information. We talked about how looking at knowing that the heart and uh, it is the most important based on time uh, to manage for a patient and that bleeds are worse than blocks, then a heart bleed has to be the worst thing that we have to address in any patient, right? So the first thing in an assessment to look for is a major hemorrhage, right? So, um, so we looked at external hemorrhage and we looked at internal hemorrhage. And I put external hemorrhage just slightly higher because like I said before, you just can't scoop up blood and put it back in. So external hemorrhage, internal hemorrhage. Now we're going to keep going. So if heart bleeds was last, then the next thing would be a heart block or a brain bleed. What do you guys think? I'm going to go with heart block, right? Because that organ is more important, right? So because that's our, we're talking about the cardiovascular, right? That's the, uh, that's the core four number one item, right? So that myocardial infarction, and for those of you, if you don't know what that is, it is a heart attack. It is a, a clog or a stoppage of blood flow in the actual heart muscle. Uh, and that prevents the heart from actually contracting because it doesn't have enough oxygen or glucose, right? The two other things that we're looking for within our core four, right? So if we did heart bleeds, we're now on heart blocks. So I think that the next most important thing to look for to assess for, to eliminate in our androgynous patient, the patient we don't have any other information about, is major hemorrhage followed by those, those things that would indicate a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, right? So that could be patients, but you get into those details by asking questions, right? Have you had this before? Have you ever had heart problems? If you see a patient and you expose their chest and you see uh, you know, the stitch line of having a previous um, heart surgery or something, that should tell you a lot about your patients, right? So I'm going to keep going with this. So next is we move to the brain bleeds, right? So brain bleed is, you know, uh, a hemorrhagic CVA or cerebrovascular accident, right? We have, a, we have a bleed inside of the brain, right? So next on the list is that hemorrhagic CVA. So I'm sure you're getting the hang of it by now. So obviously we went heart bleed, heart block, brain bleed, brain block, right? So the next one would be ischemic CVA, which, which just means that there's a lack of oxygen, but it's not a bleed necessarily. Uh, and so that tells us that there's some sort of block, right? So it's usually a clot or an embolus of some sort. It could be a little piece of fatty tissue or even some air blocking the blood flow to part of the brain, right? Um, and so there's a lot to think about here, I understand, but you're the questions you ask, your experience, that medical knowledge that we've talked about, that's how you're going to narrow these things down. So I don't want to make it real confusing for anybody, but hopefully you guys understand what I'm getting at. All right, continuing on, we'll go on to lung bleeds and go ahead and click again and lung blocks. So um, hemoptysis, what that means is coughing up blood, right? That's uh, that's having blood in the airway. That could be from spontaneously bursting a vessel within the lungs, which could bleed directly from, um, you know, the heart pumping into the lungs. Um, we've, even, we've even seen cases like somebody who has uh, exposed veins within their throat, esophageal varices, um, and they really like Doritos, right? Bad combination, right? So uh, that can cause uh, blood or cardiovascular failure in the lungs, right? Um, and then last, uh, one uh, many people are probably familiar with is a pulmonary embolism. It's a, it's a piece of uh, clot or fatty tissue or air blocking blood flow directly to the alveoli, the little sacs inside your lungs that, ex that exchange the carbon dioxide and the oxygen um, inside your lungs every time that we breathe, right? So that's the order that I look at. 
and generally, when I don't know anything about my patients, um, uh, this is how I start to assess a scene. Like, how do I, how do I rule out this list, right? And that's the key. We're going back to that deductive reasoning. We want to rule out what is on this list. Um, because a differential diagnosis, remember, is not just one thing. It is multiple things, right? So we have to go through and see what are all the things that could be wrong with my patient. That was the first question, if you remember. So moving on from that, um, we apply this process to everything else. I'm not going to go into breaking down the ventilatory system or breaking down the perfusion of oxygen or the perfusion of glucose. Um, there's other trainings for that. You guys have been through some training. If, if this is your first training, um, just pay attention to our channel, subscribe, you'll get more info on that. Um, but I'm not going to go into that. We have more to cover here today. So um, we're going to apply that same process to everything else. But the big question I get at this point in this lecture is, you know, that's a lot of information, right? You can't take like an entire physician's desk reference and just throw it at every patient, right? We don't have time for that. That's exactly what we're fighting is time. So we have to do a very important process of applying specific filters to our patient. And we do that with some very basic key pieces of information, right? So um, there are, another ordered list, I understand, three ingredients that we need to get this process started, right? And you may not even think about it, but this is these are the things that dispatch, if you use a dispatch system, hopefully are getting to you every time, right? Um, and so those three things are age, birth, gender, and chief complaint. And, I, and I, I don't mean to offend anybody, but it does change your anatomy, your birth gender, so it's important to maybe figure that out if, it, if the problem you're facing with this patient is related, okay? Uh, so age is most important. Understanding the gender of your patient is second most important. And third, a big one which kind of confuses some people, maybe not confuses, but can be more clarified, is a chief complaint, right? Um, so what is a chief complaint? It is not, and this is just a little pet peeve of mine, just so you guys know, it is not a mechanism. Okay, so, all right, so what is a chief complaint? And, and a big pet peeve of mine is that it is not a mechanism of injury. And what I mean by that is what happened to the patient, right? So if a patient was in a car accident, or if they fell down some stairs, it can be confusing sometimes as to that, as to calling that the, the chief complaint of the patient. Um, but that is a mechanism. And so that can't be the chief complaint. It has to be something the patient is either suffering from or uh, complaining of, to be obvious, right? Uh, so it's not an MVA. It's not chief complaint of MVA. It's not chief complaint of fall. It's chief complaint of they're hurting this way. Uh, it's a chief complaint of they are complaining of this. And you just know that I have got another ordered list for you guys. Maybe. Yep, yeah, another ordered list. All right. So number one, in all your patients, and this is usually in order of severity, right? That's what we're talking about. So in order of severity, number one, it is either cardiac arrest or altered mental status. Cardiac arrest, we you can think of as, as our most extremely critical patients, right? because they, they have not uh, expired, they have not died um, per se. We are trying to prevent that. We're performing a resuscitation uh, before, uh, hopefully to be successful so we don't head down that path, but it is the most severe critical patient, right? And then, but if it is not that, although cardiac arrest is a subcategory of it, if it is not cardiac arrest, it is altered mental status, right? So uh, altered mental status does encompass the chief complaint for a lot of our patients. Um, it does not, uh, we usually want to be more specific than that, but that is the appropriate chief complaint uh, if that is the biggest thing that's affecting your patient. Altered mental status tells us that there is a perfusion problem and perfusion of what? Oxygen and glucose to the, to the heart, the brain, the lungs, and the rest of the tissues that keep us alive. And so that's perfusion. It's moving those items around, right? So 
if they are altered, that's one of the first signs that that's not working appropriately, that we have a core four problem. Okay, so cardiac arrest, which is a form of altered mental status, although it's appropriate to call somebody in cardiac arrest as a chief complaint. Altered mental status is the chief complaint of many of our critical patients, and that's okay, because the description you give after, which we will get to at the end of this, uh, of how you transfer information, will give all the details as to why you chose that, okay? Uh, number two, it is, if it's not cardiac arrest and altered mental status, then it is a core four life threat. It's the primary thing based on time that is gonna injure or kill your patient, okay? Uh, and then number three, super easy, the biggest thing that they are complaining about, right? So if your patient is not altered, they're not in cardiac arrest, and they don't have a core four problem, then it's the biggest thing that they're complaining about. And if they have a big list, just ask them. Communicate with your patient. What, I, I see that you have a lot of things bothering you right now. You've listed off a few things. If I were to tell the hospital, if I were to tell the arriving EMS crew, if I were to tell the next person what your biggest complaint is, what is it? Just ask them. At the very least, you're gonna get some dialogue with that patient. Um, and that's gonna give you a lot of insight, but don't, don't forget the other things either, too. Just remember that's the chief complaint, not the only complaint, okay? Um, and for our EMS folks, it may be as simple as the patient is seeking an evaluation from a provider because of, right? And that's appropriate. That's okay, all right? So that's what a, uh, those are the filters that we apply to make this process a little easier. Because when you have age, gender, and chief complaint, and you can define those appropriately, suddenly we're not dealing with the entire physician's desk reference. We're not dealing with the, all of the human body. Suddenly, for the most part, you're dealing with 10 to 20 things that, could, that haven't been eliminated by those filters, right? Because we're, we're acting deductively. We're making deductive decisions. So what remains is your differential diagnosis. And then just like we talked in the OODA loop, we, up, we apply the information we know to assign a level of risk, which we're gonna to get to, and a level of probability, uh, which we'll also get to, to put them in order. And that tells us, you know, whatever's in number one, that's what I want to eliminate first. And if I can do that, uh, if I can successfully eliminate it, then I can move down the list and, and keep eliminating things so that there is a very fine bit of truth that I can pass on to the next person so that we're, we're saving time for that patient, really being the best for those who need us, right? All right, so this is a quote by Les Brown. If you haven't, if you haven't uh, heard anything by Les Brown, uh, totally gonna plug another YouTube channel, go look him up, right? You are not gonna hate any minute of it. So go watch some Les Brown stuff. But, but this, uh, this is a great quote. I love it, it's so obvious, but, but you know, just repeating that, uh, especially if you've had a rough day or something, this will keep you right in place, right? So if you do what is easy, your life will be hard. Um, but if you do what is hard, your life will be easy. Changing how you, you know, bringing this down to medicine, changing how you think about patient care, how you approach decision-making in the field actionably uh, is not easy. You know, a lot of what we do is instinctual. It's habits that we've built in school. It's, uh, you know, it's scars that we've developed uh, uh, just from who trained us, where we trained, and the experiences we've had. So applying something like what I'm talking about, thinking about medicine differently, moving your own perspective to provide better care is a very difficult thing, right? It takes years. You're not going to do this overnight. I'm still working on it daily. Uh, and honestly, I would argue, I haven't been through medical school, but looking at Dr. Brandt, I would argue that the majority of medical school and residency is teaching you how to think, not necessarily the academics. The academics are taught pretty quickly in the degree. The rest is how to think, how to approach the problem correctly. Because you don't have to be right, but you can't be wrong, right? So um, changing the way you think is hard. Uh, but if you follow those processes, if you take the time every day to, to make a few steps uh, to progress your abilities, gain those skills, you will outweigh the challenges that you face in life. So um, we, can, we can keep going, but just kind of take that nugget with you. Um, so I hope you like my memes on this one, but the meat and the potatoes, and I want you to know it took me a really long time to find a meme of dancing potatoes, but uh, 
So hopefully you guys appreciate that. But the meat and potatoes of all this is the differential diagnosis, right? The differential diagnosis is a list of everything that can go wrong with our patient. So um, it looks at the possible disorders that could be causing a patient's symptoms. We've talked about this this whole time. Um, it involves several tests, right? All the things that you have available to you are tests, every question you ask, every investigation you perform, what's their blood pressure, what's their pulse ox. Each separate one is an OODA loop and it is a test. And that test gives us what we talked about before, a measure of sensitivity for the reason that we're doing it, right? We're not just performing these skills to, uh, because it's habit, because it's the thing that we have to go through. It should be done with intent. If I have a patient, and, and, and let me give you an example that kind of explains it. If I have a patient that presents to me pale in their skin, they're, they feel cool, they're very diaphoretic. If I have a patient that presents to me that way, do they have a good enough blood pressure? Is their blood pressure high enough to be supporting uh, their organs, right? That, that's kind of obvious, it's a no, because pale, cool, diaphoretic skin is the first sign of shock. That's the indication that blood pressure is not appropriate. Something is causing a problem. Could it be something else? Absolutely, because we're not gonna get tunnel vision into anything. But is taking a blood pressure, which does take a bit of time, especially if you don't do it a lot, um, and or you don't have a good stethoscope or you haven't been taught how to do it by palpation, um, is that the most important thing in that moment? It's important, yes, but is it the first thing we should be doing? And so that's what I'm challenging you to do, is take the information and the skills that you've been taught, uh, the, the assessment items that you've learned and really start to rethink how can I dynamically apply what I've learned to my patients to be the best because they need me. Be efficient with my time because it's their time, right? You're, for some of us, you're getting paid, right? So it's, it's their time that we're working on, right? So uh, that's what we're really going for, is changing our, our decision process so that we can be the most efficient. Uh, going back to that example, do we want a blood pressure? Absolutely, we need to get a blood pressure so that we can watch it over time. Uh, but if there's other factors I need to address, uh, maybe it's not first on the list. And so just rethink, you know, I'm not saying change how you do stuff, but do rethink, you know, uh, especially retrospectively, every time you run on a patient, every time you go to a call, think back, how could I have done that better? How could I have been more efficient with the information I had? And that over time, that's how you're going to be a really good provider. So, um, all right, keep going. And all right, so can you think of differential diagnoses for chest pain, right? And I actually, I don't know if you guys, what our delay is here, but I'd like to see if you guys can throw me out some, some uh, into the chat, throw me some differential diagnoses for chest pain. So you have an individual with chest pain. These for chest pain. So you have an individual with chest pain. And I'll give you guys a few minutes here and, okay, I'll give you guys a few minutes here and kind of see what you guys can come up with. Um, and we do have a little bit of a delay, so if we don't get anything back in that, that's all right, we'll keep going. But, but uh, I just want to see what you guys could come up with. This is a fun class in person, so if, you, uh, if anybody has their EMT, advanced EMT or paramedic license, come work for us, you get to do this in person. So a little plug there. Cool, so we got one that's pulmonary embolism. Great, so that's, that's, that's awesome. That, that goes right into the differential diagnosis. Do we have any others? Real quick, guys. Uh, pulmonary embolism, pneumonia, and, and there's more too. Like you can think about the, uh, the heart, right? You have uh, myocardial infarction. Um, you can have, uh, we just got another one for uh, pleurisy, which is like some rubbing of the lungs against the outer wall of the chest, which can cause some pain, right? Um, a good one is chest injury. Um, so uh, these are all things that we have to think of. So when you walk into a home or you walk onto a scene and a patient tells you that they have chest pain, right? We're not, 
I don't want you to jump right to the heart attack or the obvious things that we are always taught about, we always think about. I want you to kind of really use this process to look at their age, you know, their gender, their chief complaint, and then use that to filter down. But think of as many things as you can and then start eliminating them, eliminating them with the skills and tools that you have available to you, right? So uh, if you have, uh, for instance, a, you know, a 15-year-old with chest pain, is the first thing I'm thinking about going to be a heart attack? Probably not. Is it possible? Absolutely it's possible. But is that the first thing I'm worried about? Maybe not, but it's definitely going in my list. Right, so these other things you mentioned, uh, uh, a pneumothorax, that's a great one. Good job, whoever that was. Uh, uh, pleurisy pain, uh, chest injury, uh, pneumonia, pulmonary embolism, costochondritis, which is, uh, which is pain from in the muscles around the ribs from movement. Those are all excellent examples. But I challenge you to think, when you're with a patient, do you actually think about each one of these every time you look at somebody? Every time you have these interviews, these investigations with your patients, are you looking at everything, right? I don't either, but I'm working on it, right? And you can too. You, if, if you expand uh, your knowledge there, but I'm working on it, right? And you can too. You, if, if you expand uh, your knowledge of what could be, you become better and better at what you do. And then you have more, more items that you can attempt to eliminate with the tools that you have at your disposal. And the best part is you don't miss anything. And that's the key. Uh, you don't have to be right, but you can't be wrong. So that's the goal of all of this, this whole discussion. That's really the desired end state we wanna reach is your ability to consider everything. That's what it is. So let's go to the next one. All right, so let's practice some risk. And again, this is usually an in-person thing that we can do a little bit more with, so I'll kind of walk through it a little slower with you. Uh, but we're gonna talk about risk, right? We talked about that a bunch in the beginning. How do you evaluate risk and probability? Well, let's walk through it. How do you actually evaluate risk with your patient? Um, risk is the life-threatening capacity of a differential diagnosis in a given situation. So if the differential diagnosis is missed, or misrecognized, if you missed it, what happens to that patient? So we're gonna just quantify it. This doesn't mean anything. This is just a way to, to evaluate this right here, okay? So let's assign it a value, like a one, two, or three. So a one, it'll make them mad, okay? So if you missed it or failed to diagnose it, it would make them mad, right? You didn't consider it, it would make them mad. A two would be it would cause them injury. A three would be it will kill them. If you miss it or, or failed to diagnose it, it's gonna kill them. And so this is how I kind of look at things uh, uh, when we approach risk with our differential diagnosis. It makes it super easy. Obviously, as you can tell, I love numbers and ordered lists, so it falls right in line with how I think. But let's evaluate. So I think I'm dual screened up there, right? I'm not a little boxed. Okay, so this is full screen, excellent. So we have a 65-year-old female, and, and I'm just explaining what's on the right here. 65-year-old female with a chief complaint of nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And this has been going on for six days, okay? So if I have a 65-year-old female with a chief complaint of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea times six days, what does that first tell you? Is she altered? No, because that's not my chief complaint, right? See how, much, see how powerful that is? Two, uh, is she suffering from a core four life threat at the moment with the information we have? No because none of those are necessarily core four life threats. So we're dealing with the number three uh, chief complaint, what they're complaining of, right? So that tells us a lot just in that first sentence. And that's the kind of information you get from dispatch, hopefully, or from um, crews on scene or anything like that. So if we were to evaluate, say in our differential diagnosis list, we have a triple A, which, which stands for a dissecting, means there's a tear, abdominal, uh, aortic aneurysm, right? So there's a tear um, or a ballooning of the aorta, which is the main uh, uh, oxygenated blood vessel coming out of the heart, right? So if we have a dissecting AAA in the 65-year-old female, think about what risk level would you assign that patient? That's all the information you have. Would you give them a one? Is it gonna make them mad if you miss it? Would you give them a two? Will it cause injury if you miss it? 
Or would you give it a three? Will it kill them if you miss it? And you don't have to respond. I just want you to think about this. Uh, I would argue, there's anecdotal cases, but I would argue almost every time a dissecting AAA that is, missed, uh, that is not diagnosed or missed is probably going to kill your patient, right? Especially the 65-year-old female with that complaint. All right, so let's assess that on the other person. We have a 22-year-old male with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, but this has only been going on for six hours, right? Tells us the same information in the beginning. But if we're assessing for the differential diagnosis of a triple A, a dissecting uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, what is the risk? Will it make them mad? Will it injure them? Or will it kill them? And again, I would argue that the seriousness of that problem uh, is probably going to kill them. So despite the fact that we're dealing with two completely different demographics, the risk is still very high with that assessment. So you see how that is? Um, risk can be very static, meaning that it doesn't change across demogra demographics for the most part, right? So to counteract that, because it does change a little bit, let's look at the other one. So 65-year-old female, chief complaint, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea times six days, and we're assessing the difference, we're on the list item of influenza, right? So if we're evaluating for influenza, Will it make them mad, cause injury, or kill them? And usually in class, the first thing that I hear is it'll probably make them mad or it'll injure them. But I challenge you to e explore uh, more knowledge into pathophysiology and disease processes. You can do this free. It's on your phone, on, on the internet. Think about this. Uh, I'm sure people can cite statistics and call me wrong in this, but I, I believe that influenza has killed more people than all known wars combined in the history of the world. It's pretty dangerous, right? Now, we have a lot of vaccinations and things and ways to, to mitigate that and prevent it, but a lot of people don't look at the flu as super dangerous anymore because of uh, medical advances. But in somebody who is um, at the age of 65, who has been dehydrated, in every possible way for nearly a week, the danger of an influenza infection is severe. That patient can, can very likely die from that. Uh, and so that's important. So the risk again would be a three for her, right? Now, if we evaluate that same influenza with the 22 year old male with nausea, vomiting and diarrhea, but only for six hours, uh, what do you think? Do you think it'll still kill them? Influenza we know is bad. Or will it cause injury? Or will it make them mad? But this is taking in the right amount of information, right? We know that losing fluids through nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea for only six hours in a 22-year-old male who generally, you know, demographically has a more robust immune system, um, not given other details, it will probably cause injury if we miss it, right? It could make the dehydration worse. It could lead to other problems. Uh, but for the most part, you could argue that it's not going to kill them. So there is a variance in our risk. So being aware of how disease processes work, learning pathophysiology. Just uh, look that up. I got some information that the Spanish flu killed 675,000 people and World War II only killed 405,000 people. And so, good, there's some great facts for you guys there. I don't know where that's from. I can't cite it, but, um, and don't worry about it. The John people, Hopkins. oh, that's from John Hopkins. Okay, excellent. So that's, that makes the point exactly. So, so risk can be very static depending on what it is, but it can also be variable. And uh, the big key is those filters that you can go through, the age, gender, chief complaint. It's going to narrow down your list quite a bit, and it's going to help you as assign um, a risk value to help you orient the order in which you're, you're uh, assessing for your differential diagnosis items, right? So moving on from that, once we know the risk of any of our differential diagnoses, that doesn't mean it's real, right? That's just what the information tells us could be possible. So as we're going through our deductive thought process, we also have to assign a level of probability, how realistic it is that the patient actually has this disease, you know? working on your own personal sensitivity, if you will, your ability to detect things that actually are. So the likelihood of a differential diagnosis item is the probability. 
can you recognize probability? It does take information, um, and this is usually what people are working on on scene, um, and then we kind of have a general knowledge of risk that we just apply to our decisions. But this is usually what people are seeking when we're gaining information, when we're doing our investigations on scene. So again, we'll quantify it. We'll say that number one is low. Uh, it's unlikely, right, with this patient. Number two means that it requires further testing. There's another test, just like with the marbles earlier. You have to perform another test. You have to move to the next OODA loop to gain more information so that you can make a better decision. Um, so it requires further testing. And then three, we can say that it has positive test results. And that's very key that we say it that way. We're not, there's never a yes, they have it, right? Very rare. Uh, it's positive test results because we have to confirm that in other ways. That's why medicine is a practice. That's why people go to the ER, to their physician, and they run a bunch of tests, and it takes time to identify a diagnosis. Even though we want the information now, you don't want to have a false, uh, a, a false positive or a false negative because uh, then you don't meet the, uh, you don't have to be right, but you can't be wrong. You don't want to be wrong, right? So you want to make sure that we perform the tests that truly confirm it. So a three just means positive test results. It doesn't mean necessarily that they have it. It just means that you absolutely can't r remove it from your differential diagnosis list, right? Uh, okay, so same patients, same problems. So let's assign a probability to those patients. So the 65-year-old female with a chief complaint of nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea times six days, and we work on the, we're working on the the dissecting uh, AAA, the abdominal aortic aneurysm, uh, what is the probability, given the information you have at hand, no other questions, what is the probability you think that you would face? And you don't have to answer, we're just gonna walk through this. I just want you thinking about this, okay? Uh, so the probability that she has a AAA, well, let's look at the pathophysiology. Uh, and this will go into a little bit of opinion because I can only speak from my own experience as well, right? Uh, and Dr. Brent can interject at any time, but uh, we have the triple A in the 65-year-old female who has had nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea for almost a week, right? Could she have a triple A? Possibly, yeah. Uh, I would say, I would probably put it in the two category and requires further test results because if you understand the pathophysiology of the the emergent dissecting AAA, is that it's usually a sudden onset, right? And if she is vomiting for more than a week, could she have caused it? Yes, uh, but she's probably she would drastically make it worse if she had been dealing if that was the original causation of her symptoms. And if you're bleeding out internally, which is what that causes, it's not going to last for a week. I can promise you that. So. Uh, that is understanding the pathophysiology of what you're addressing. And you don't have to know all this stuff right off the bat, but I challenge you on every patient, take five minutes, hit up Google or DuckDuckGo or whatever you want to use and learn one thing about your last patient. Just one thing. Just one little thing. You can look at their medication list, you can look at things that they said, other diagnoses they've had and hit one thing, just spend five minutes, skim it real quick, store that information. You do that every patient over a career, you will master this field. So I challenge you to do that. Especially for my new folks, it is imperative that you do that, right? Um, all right, so what about influenza for that same, that 65-year-old female? What do we know? You probably know the signs and symptoms of influenza. It's pretty common diagnosis, right? So if that is our differential diagnosis we're evaluating, uh, we don't have a flu test, so can we say positive test results? Usually people jump to three, but we don't have positive test results. We have high sensitivity, but we don't have positive test results. Um, I absolutely wouldn't eliminate it, but we definitely need to perform required testing. But that tells us that part of that patient healthcare continuum we talked about is that we know there are long-term needs this patient must have beyond us, right? Thinking outside of our silo, they need a flu test. And that is a likely thing that we're gonna address when they get to the final uh, 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 healthcare facility or the ER or their doctor or whatever. Um, now the 22 year old male with nausea, vomiting and diarrhea by six hours, uh, the AAA, 
you know, that's, that probably moves it up a little bit because it comes on quickly. Um, it can happen in just about any uh, demographic, but you could ask questions about, say, what they were doing. Um, you know, here in Missouri, we do a lot of time at the lakes and cliff jumping and things like that. You do a backflop from 30 feet up in the air onto water, could you tear your aorta? Pretty easily, right? And could you be sick for about six hours before they call for help? Absolutely. So it raises it up on that list a little bit, right? Um, and then we have uh, influenza in that patient. Six hours, I'm probably, you know, if this was more innocuous, I'm probably going to step down a little bit to more of an unlikely. It's definitely possible, but probably more of an unlikely. We could absolutely run more tests. Uh, but a 22-year-old who's nauseous, vomiting, and diarrhea, maybe they just had a good time last night, you know? So, uh, so but we don't want to assume anything either. We still want to evaluate our patient, but, but there's definitely no positive test results for influenza. Uh, you could say it requires further testing, but I would argue that there are other priorities, so I would move it to a one. So hopefully you guys understand what I'm talking about there. All right, so this is a great time uh, for us to do a, a attendance check. So this should be posted here in just a couple of seconds, but we're gonna have you guys do an attendance check again. Uh, again, go to the top of the chat, hit that link, um, and in there you're gonna enter two things. You're gonna enter the code that we're gonna give you and you're gonna enter your, um, and in there you're gonna enter two things. You're gonna enter the code that we're gonna give you and you're gonna enter your, your license, uh, number or you enter your license number and we're going to give you a code check and so it's in the chat but i'm also going to say it for you it's three six three zero zero and so i'll give you guys some time to to uh, implement that or, or put that in for us All right, guys. So, uh, what is our current time here live? Eleven twenty-five. Okay. So we got another break coming in. And let's keep going with this. All right. So we've kind of talked about this a little bit, and this meme sums it up perfectly. Uh, glassy stare. What do I do with all this information, right? And, and I've hit on this a little bit as we go through, but the key is prioritizing what is important to you every time you go to take the next intervention or the next investigation with your patients. It's doing it in the most efficient order by deductively uh, working through what you're presented with, with your patient, okay? Uh, so prioritizing what's important each time, utilize the treatments that you have avail available to you, utilize the assessments that you have available to you, um, learn from your colleagues and other cohorts. You know, I've learned more things from FIRE than I, than I ever thought I would, and, I, and hopefully I've taught a bunch to FIRE. I've learned a ton from law enforcement just working with them on scene, and I, I have learned absolutely the most by just emulating my peers. Uh, and so I, I challenge you to do that. Uh, young, old, new, experienced, everybody has something to offer. And I, I challenge you to learn. Take away something from everybody you work with. At the very least, it creates a better community for our public safety. Um, and so that helps us achieve that vision and that mission way better. Uh, be the best for those who need us. So the big question, every time you perform a uh, uh, an investigation, uh, an intervention, every time you process a deductive reasoning, a decision OODA loop, the goal of that, the whole entire point of that is to get to the next test. What is the next test you're going to perform? For my ambulance people, everything on that left side of the truck is at your disposal. You have to decide what's most important. And that also goes with all the verbal stuff, all the questions you can ask and, and your interview questions and your rapport. And for my fire folks and my police folks, uh, you know, you have your go bag or you have your rescue bag. You know, you don't have as many tools uh, per se, but 
what in there is going to best serve you in the next decision, right? We don't want to waste our patient's time because that's what we're fighting at all times. And this is all regarding critical patients, you know, for the most part. We, we, all, have, we, we all do this because we love it. We, we have pretty good rapport with the patients and, that aren't critical. We, have, we get a lot of experience in how to, you know, interact with others in those cases. But really for the critical patients, when time is of the essence, we have to be quick. Uh, and so pre-planning how you make that decision process, that's what this is all about. So what is the next test? That's really what we're going for. All right, and then the last piece of the OODA loop, and I only put one thing on this slide for a reason. If you have deductively worked through a process and you have, you have put this much time and effort into a single decision, now in reality this happens in split seconds, right? You, this is a thing that you learn to do quickly. Uh, but the most important thing you can do is act. You can sit and think all you want, but if you don't act, you don't solve anything. You don't fix anything, you don't move a patient, right? Those are actions. So I'm just trying to help you reach a way to make your actions more effective. But the action is what matters. So have faith, trust in yourself, that you have made the right decision because you've applied yourself. Um, you've taken some lessons from this, uh, from your career, from your experience, from your colleagues, and you know you're making the right decision. Uh, we all freeze sometimes. I still do on calls. It happens. You're just trying to process a lot of information. But if you can step outside yourself for a second and think, you know, okay, this is the information I have. Uh, I'm going to orient myself. This is what I want to rule out. What am I going to do about this? What's the next test? Then act on it because you've made the decision with clear intention. And that's how you be a, an excellent provider. And I'm working towards that with you. All right. Next slide. All right. I, I really like this quote. Uh, hopefully you guys. Uh, uh, yeah, I just it got. It just got sent to me, remember to don't get stuck in analysis paralysis. That's exactly what I was getting at. Exactly what I was getting at. So, um, good. Thank you, Ty. Uh, the, uh, this quote I really like. Uh, you can find it on YouTube yourself. But uh, Will Smith uh, was, I don't know if you're a fan or not, but I was just watching. And he was getting really real, just kind of talking to the camera. Um, and he said in the middle of that, he said, what matters I think he said what matters most is what you do when you are alone, uh, when it is just you and your character. And, you know, a lot of value systems use the word integrity, and that's, you know, everybody knows what that means, doing the right thing at the right time. Um, I challenge you to think about your character more. Uh, character is doing the right thing all times. When nobody's watching, making the right decision, doing that right thing, even if it's out of your way, that's character. Doing it when somebody's watching, that's integrity. So you see the difference there? So I challenge you to uh, boost your character and do the right thing. Um, and so you can make your character better uh, in a grander sense as a provider by always challenging yourself to learn more. Uh, no matter how much experience you have in this field, you can and will learn more. So, so I challenge you to just embrace that and, and drive forward. All right, so the next piece of this, we've covered a lot of the decisions, right? We've, we've covered most of how we make decisions uh, with critical thinking in mind, clinical critical thinking. But a big piece of this at the very end, when we do choose to act, a lot of things may tell us this is all the right piece. The one thing that we do have to, to weigh in, though, is our, is our risk. Not risk like we were talking before, but our risk. Risk to our missions, risk to what we do, uh, risk to achieving other objectives outside of us. Uh, because we're not just in this alone. Uh, to do risk mit mitigation, we must identify the procedure that is wanted or needed. So that step one is everything we've talked about this whole day, right? Everything up until now. Step two, though, is we have to provide a risk-benefit analysis for what we're doing. And that comes down to asking, is this in the best interest of my patient? Is what I'm about to do the best thing? Does it impact, remember uh, from the beginning, that patient care continuum? Does it impact the end state of our patient, how they go home? Not how I bring them to the next person, but how they go home. Uh, so does it, is it in the best interest of my patient? 
does the potential outcome, if I don't do it, or I'm sorry, yeah, if, if I don't do it, does that justify the risk of doing it? So that you have to evaluate what you're doing to make sure that it is the right thing. And that comes back to the character piece and the integrity piece as well. And then once you've evaluated for risk, I'm all for it, act, do it. But step four is most important. You have to reassess. Anytime that you intervene, uh, anytime you perform an intervention, you must confirm it continuously. You must make sure that you are, that the situation doesn't change. And although it may have been right at one time, that it is, if it's not right now, I need to recognize that. And so that's super important for you to understand. Um, and, and that's how we become really good providers. We all try things uh, because the situation presents it as the correct thing to do, or maybe the intervention we did uh, has changed a little bit. And a good example is say you have a patient who has a severe uh, extremity bleed and you whip out your tourniquet and you apply it and it stops the bleed, high five, you did a great job, patient thanks you, you move them to the next phase and it loosens up. Do you recognize it? That's the key because you can slip right back in. Doing it once and not reassessing is not gonna be successful for our patients, and that goes for literally everything you do. That's why, uh, that's why you are credentialed, why some of you get paid, that's what we're doing, is to, to constantly reevaluate to make sure that we're doing the best for our patients. So, um, mm, not, there we go. Okay, so, um, Evaluating risk. So let's let's look at this from a realistic perspective. What about a blood pressure? Uh, most of you, a lot of you, have probably taken a blood pressure before. Uh, what do you see as the risk of taking a blood pressure? Are there any risks to taking a blood pressure? Uh, are there risks? And think to yourself. You don't have to type anything, but but think to yourself. Are there any risks to taking a blood pressure? Uh, I hear a mixed bag when it, when it's in class. Uh, about half people say no. Have people kind of, yeah, yeah, there's, there's kind of a risk to it, uh, but what are they? Uh, and, it, and although there's risks, there's also benefits or we wouldn't do it, right? So what are the risks? What are the benefits? Uh, I can't remember what the next animation is, but oh yeah, what will happen if I don't do it? So let's answer those. So what are the risks to taking a blood pressure? So the first thing that I can think of is if you take a blood pressure, um, you have to think how that affects the body. If you place it on the upper arm of a patient and you uh, increase the pressure, um, you know, if you've taken a blood pressure before, especially on maybe an elderly individual, they have probably reached out to tell you to stop because it hurts. There's a lot of pressure in, in a blood pressure cuff just to get that information. So if they have anything in that skin or in that area of their body that could be damaged by that much pressure, you have to think that that could absolutely be a risk. For instance, if we have a patient who goes through uh, dialysis, and uh, you may have seen a fistula, uh, what we call a fistula, a plastic tube inside of their skin that allows uh, dialysis centers to access their blood. Um, if you put a blood pressure over that and you compress it to high pressure, there's a, there's a chance that you could tear it away from the vessel and cause an internal bleed. So that's a pretty significant risk, right? Um, and then the lymph nodes have been removed for somebody who's had a mastectomy, a, a, a breast removal for cancer reasons. The lymph nodes have been removed. So if you add pressure to that, you could damage the lymph system and cause an infection. So that's huge. Um, so are there risks to taking a blood pressure? Absolutely, there are risks to taking a blood pressure. So we have to evaluate those things. But you can, e you can easily mitigate that. You can move it down the arm. You can move to another arm. Even on adults, you can take it on their ankle if you need to. You can get blood pressures other ways. Um, so uh, what are the benefits? The benefit of a blood pressure is, you know, we get their blood pressure. We understand how they're perfusing. And that's big. And if I don't do it, which I think, yeah, what, what will happen if I don't do it? Um, we miss out on that information. I guarantee you, no matter what phase of healthcare you are in or what part of public safety, the next person receiving your patient is probably going to ask what their blood pressure was if you had the capability. So you give, you increase the time it takes to assess that patient. Um, if, if, if you're not getting that information and providing it on, um, we kind of lose some of the picture. Uh, 
because uh, if you think about it, transferring care from one individual to the next or from one service to the next or from one f facility to the next, the goal, our purpose as public safety is to reduce the time as a whole on the macro. So if we can help make it a little easier for the next people, then we save the patient time. And that's what's really important. That's why solid reports, patient transfer of care information is super important. And doing you know, appropriate assessments, even if you don't have a ton of time with your patient, getting the key pieces is super important. All right, uh, part of risk management, it's kind of a fringe thing, but it is really important, especially uh, for more distributed services like our bigger fire departments, the EMS agencies. Um, and, you know, likewise for our smaller services too, because you aren't dealing with a lot of resources. We have to identify our community mission, you know, providing better health care to our overall community. If this was your family, you'd want the best for them, right? Same for me. I evaluate all of our recruits and all of our, our employees based on whether or not I would let them run on my wife and be comfortable with it. And I'm happy to say everybody that works here, all for it. I think you guys are fantastic. Um, and I want that for our community as well. Um, and that's why we're doing stuff like this. Uh, so we have to identify the mission of our community. We have to identify the, the mission of our team. Right? And that may be where you work, that may, that may be your uh, sector of public safety, that may be uh, the team you're with, the, you know, a crew on an ambulance or a fire truck or whoever responded there with you, that might be your team. And then for yourself, you have to identify your personal mission. The scenes are dynamic and that will constantly change, but keeping that in the forefront of, you know, what is my desired end state in this? What is the goal that I need to achieve? That is really important when you decide uh, in risk management, what is the next and most appropriate decision? And then you have to apply the risk management techniques we talked about and ask yourself, how can I support all of these missions at once and still provide the best possible, possible patient care and the best support for those patients? And that, I mean, that really, that sums up everything that we all do. And just as a little note, you know, we're all very busy uh, and that's across the country. There are, there are always other emergencies. You never know what's coming next. And, and if it was right next to where you, you just were, so, uh, or where somebody was that you pulled for a resource. So if, you're, if you ask for more resources, make sure you do, sh do so judiciously, that you turn them around when you don't need them so that we can always serve that community mission and our team mission, right? And then that'll help you in your individual mission because, uh, you know, the better that we can do that, everybody else is going to be happier, especially if by chance it's somebody, you know, that we're responding to is somebody that they love. So next one. All right. So this is a big one I really wanted to cover. I'll kind of just walk through it. We're getting to the tail end here. I think we're almost at the last slide here. Um, uh, so I'm, thanks for bearing with me, guys. Uh, but the last big piece like I said just a few minutes ago, is how you transfer care, how you push information to the next phase in the patient healthcare continuum. This is not something to be taken lightly. In fact, I would argue to, to work on this before anything else we've talked about today. How you give information and communicate with others is the most important thing you can do in this field. Um, and that goes from the brand new uh, emergency responder all the way up to the 30-year paramedic, right? And, and that's just a, a number. Sorry if somebody's worked here longer than 30 years. But, uh, but this is, you can have your own way of doing that. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. I just want to give you a guide. Uh, and the PowerPoint's up, right, for them? Okay, good. So I just want to give you a guide on if you feel like you're a little lost, this is a great way to, to, to think about how you're going to give information so that we can make this the most efficient process as patients move through the healthcare continuum. And this is what we call a modified SBAR. And that stands for Situation, Background, Assessment, Actions, and Results. And if you want to write this down, this will all be recorded so you can get it. If you subscribe to us, we'll, you'll find out when this gets posted, okay? So, situation. The situation is meant to provide a summary of how the patient ended up in the current situation, as well as any special information about the current illness or injury. This would be where you would document or report to the next person 
a patient's chief complaint, and the review of systems. So a review of systems is reviewing what you know to be normal uh, throughout the body and what you found. You know, reporting what's normal is just as important a bit, uh, to a point as what's as what you find to be abnormal. So that's really good that you get that information there. Um, number two, background. The background of the situation tells us a lot, a lot of information. There's a difference between a report that says grandma fell and a report that says grandma fell but family told me she fell four times this week and she takes blood thinners. So that's a big difference in the background of our patients. And so that's good to pass along. So that's meant to give a history of the patient and a relative or important information which might have contributed to the current situation which you just described. Um, and this is where you document or report the history of the present illness, what you have found about, about the abnormalities, the differential diagnoses that you still have on your list. Stomp, stomp, remember that. Uh, the assessment. So this is what you've done. What have you found for information? It's meant to provide documentation on your objective findings. Not how you feel, but the objective findings that you've learned. Your pertinent positives, your pertinent negatives, your sensitivities, your specificities uh, about your patient's present illness. This would be where you would document what you found in your physical exam um, and what you found in the additional investigations you did throughout each OODA loop as you went through your critical decision making. Um, actions. Actions is the next day. It's meant to provide documentation of your interventions. What did you do for your patient? Because, because when you pass along information, it's great to know what's, hap what's happened, but we have to know how you mitigated it too. Or if you didn't, that's fine. We just have to know what has or has not been done. Um, and sharing that is of the utmost importance. Because uh, having done something or, or for our medics or our advanced people or even our EMTs, uh, if you've given a medication and you forget to, to add that along, uh, there could be a, a potential harm done if we give another medication that's similar. So that's really important. Uh, this, is, uh, this is best to be described in a chronological order. Just start top to bottom, how and what you did stuff, or how and what you did. Uh, this will aid in identifying your patient care process. It'll help, uh, say, for my EMS folks who drop off at the hospital, this really helps the physicians who do tend to think the way we're talking about today. Uh, this really helps them kind of catch up to, to where you are in the differential diagnosis process, saving the patient time, saving the physician time, um, and really creating a good rapport with everybody. Um, and same for my fire folks, CMS, and, and police to fire, and, and every interaction in between. Remember to leave numbers. Uh, this is for documentation for our guys. Remember to leave numbers and specifics in your flowchart, not your narrative. But when you're given a verbal report, be sure to share all of that, how much specific times, uh, sorry, specific numbers. And then the big one, the big last one is results. Uh, just like you reassess what you do, we have to describe the results of the actions that we took or didn't take. Uh, and that's really important. Uh, we, have to, we have to provide that for the next person um, and we have to document it in our written form as well. So this is meant to follow up the action section with necessary information about the improvement the decline or lack of changes an intervention has on the patient's conditions. So, um, so that is our modified SBAR. Again, this is not how I want you to do it. This is a guide if you don't have a process, but the key is getting all those pieces of information, whatever your technique is, okay? So we're not gonna micromanage you or tell you how to do it. I just wanna make sure that you understand what's important to get across. And, and then you find your process, you find your success in that, and that's, that's where we find importance. So, uh, next slide. All right, so, um, oh, what did you just have up there? Because I did want to repeat that. What did you say? Yes, so communicate, this came from, from Ty, our Christian County educator. Uh, uh, communication is the most important uh, aspect of human relations, and that that is to a T, to a T. So I'm really glad you said that. I'm glad that popped up. Sorry, I missed that. Um, so we're coming to an end here. Uh, the only constant between all people, rich or poor, success or failure, is they all get 24 hours in a day. 
the difference between you and Jeff Bezos, look them up if you don't know, the only difference is how they spend those 24 hours. Uh, where you're at right now does not define your future. What you do today does. So remember that. Um, you can apply and grow and learn, and hopefully this is a beginning of a good uh, uh, medical career or first responder or public safety career for you and how you approach patients uh, and my community. So next slide for you and how you approach patients uh, and my community. So next slide and then click. All right, it's done guys. Hopefully you enjoy these memes. Hopefully I don't get in any trouble for them. And one more click. Yes, Mr. Frodo, it's over now. So I'm done talking. All right. Um, so what we're going to do now is we are going to take a... All right. Um, so what we're going to do now is we are going to take a 10-minute break. We're going to take a 10-minute break. Uh, we're going to put up the logo. We're not going anywhere. I just want you to take a break. I need to get some water as well. Um, and then we're going to start our Q&A session. And after that, if we don't have anything, or we have a couple of questions, I believe, at the least, after that, we'll send out your test link and your survey link. Fill that out. We'll get you plugged in the system and get you some CEUs. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, thank you. All right. All right, guys. Looks like we're live again. Yep. Audio. Cool. All right. So we do have, uh, just to get this portion started, we do have one more attendance check for you, and we will have an additional at the end of this. So uh, hit that link that's pinned at the top of your chat. Um, and the number is going to be 38460. Enter that code and then enter your license number if you have one, or just put something there if you don't. Um, and then that will give help us give you credit. We, we will do one more attendance check, so stay with us on that. Um, so, uh, hopefully, uh, I didn't bore you guys too much. Hopefully you got something out of that. This will be recorded so you guys can watch it later as well. But with me now, I have our medical director, Dr. Brandt, um, and we are here to answer some questions for you. Um, so please enter them. There is a little bit of a delay, but type in the chat, ask us any questions, anything you have for Dr. Brandt, anything for me, uh, about the lecture, about COX EMS, um, and we'll try and give you the best answer we can, or, or at least direct you in the right, the right direction. So um, the first question I know that was asked is, will you get CEUs if you watch the recorded version on YouTube later? And the answer is, unfortunately, no. That is just beneficial for you. In order for us to give these CEUs, we're going to have to treat it as live. So you'd have to, you would have had to have attended and hit all those attendance checks, or 70% uh, of those for us. But so I apologize. There will be more, though. We will cover these topics again, uh, uh, and and add more to these. Uh, but there, the recorded version won't get you CEUs. But you know, it's still beneficial. Uh, it still gives you an idea of what we're teaching here at Cox Health Paramedicine. But um, do we have any other questions come through? Anything come? And one of the one of the things that uh, I would recommend that you think about and comment in or add in your feedback when you do the review of this is what other uses can we use this tool for? Uh, things that I've already, the things that we've been discussing, uh, answering questions for grand rounds. Uh, answering questions about topics that are pertinent to uh, events like this format would have been awesome in March and April. Uh, so that so one answering questions in grand rounds Two uh, answering questions about topical su subjects, uh, new protocol changes, stuff like that. Those are things that I would yeah. think that this I don't think it's going to replace some educational stuff but I think it can augment it for sure. So put that in your comments, put that in your review. We want to see what other uses we can make of this very powerful tool. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we've discussed a little bit here too that I don't think that we necessarily want to replace anything with this. We still want to make sure that we get face to face with people, you know, with the right precautions. But this is meant as a tool to add to, you know, the services we deliver and, and help you gain some CEUs and make the the license 
pro uh, maintenance process a little easier and, and maybe add to your repertoire you know over time as well so not a not a uh, question but we did get a comment that you know this has been very beneficial and I'm really glad to hear that there's a lot of production that went into this and and uh, this was our first time so if we did halfway professional I'm super excited about it but uh, we're only going to get better with this as we go so um, so yeah uh, what you had a couple of questions or did you have any questions that we needed to address All right, well, we'll give it a couple more minutes. We'll kind of just hang out with you and see, because I know there's a delay. We'll see if you guys have anything else. Um, if you want to, uh, Jessica, can you post for them the feedback link? Um, so we can maybe even replace, or no, let's leave the attendance pin, but we can put the feedback link. So we have a survey for you guys, and I would uh, I'd really appreciate it if you guys would fill that out and fully, uh, enter, or fully complete that, not just NAs on the comment boxes, but like give us an idea. There's a couple like scoring grid type of things, but let us know how we can make this better. Like Dr. Brandt said, how can we utilize this as a tool that's gonna benefit you in the future? Uh, you know, this is, this is the future of, of education. It's not gonna be all of it, but, uh, but we definitely wanna utilize this feature if you find benefit in it. So tell us how we can uh, uh, how we can do that. So um, so it is the uh, the edu slash feedback edu dot com slash feedback. So uh, looks like we do have a question coming in. So uh, I believe it says I'm gonna go out of frame here. I think it would be neat if we. Uh, broke down every one of the protocol algorithms, even if it's eventual. Like maybe 15 to 30 minute mini lectures for each of the protocols. That's a lot of protocols, man. You really like YouTube, but I think we could do something along those lines. I think, you know, some, some thought process behind education and, of course, the medical direction for, for why the protocols do what they do. I think we could certainly address that to a point. What do you think? I think, well, not only that, but I think that, uh, you know, Tom Lewis and I have discussed having uh, events where we are together and people are able to log in and ask us questions. I think that'd be fun. The cliche coffee break. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Tom calls it. Tom calls it uh, uh, coffee with the medical director. Coffee but, with the medical director. Yeah, right. I think that'd be fun. All right. Um, yeah, that's it with the HTTPS. But yeah, so uh, I'll read it off to you here. But uh, if you want to fill out that survey for us, I really appreciate it if you will. It's going to be edu like education edu dot coxems c o x e m s dot com slash feedback so edu.coxems.com slash feedback and that's going to be posted in the chat for you please fill that out that's going to give us every all the information we need to move forward so that totally comes from you guys um, do you have any other questions coming through okay all right all right well i think that's uh that's all we have the next thing that we're going to do is push out the uh the link to the test so there is a test for you to receive ceus there you have to get past the uh, 10 question test if you have trouble with it or the grade is not enough uh, we will uh, we will get a hold of you um, or you can get a hold of us with that number by text um, and and help uh, work through some of the information. Most of it is is entirely based on the big points that we went through with that PowerPoint. Um, if you have any questions, we're going to leave the chat up for a minute, so feel free to jump in. We won't give you the answer, but we can guide you a little bit. Um, and so the next link uh, will be the test. So go ahead and fill that out if you do want the CEUs for this. Um, and right before you do that and sign off, be sure to do our very last attendance check. So real quick, hit the link on that pin, uh, enter the code 3880, 3880, 
three three eight zero uh, and enter that as your code and your license number this is the last attendance check and then take your test we're gonna go to no audio and a, and a sign and just leave the chat up. Let us know if you have any issues and then we'll close it here in a few minutes. But I really appreciate your time. Thanks for viewing and uh, hit the like, hit the subscribe and we'll check you next time. Thanks for coming. Looking forward to the next one.